Hello and welcome to our game here on Monday morning. Myself, Shane Stables, and joined as ever by Michael Verney. We're brought to you by OrgoRetro.com. Use the promo code our game and you'll get 15% off of any of the great jerseys that are on display on the website there. Maybe this Tipperary jersey. <laughs> you know, we won't be seeing too much more of it again this season. Michael well, Verney's we, in the goal. We, 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 we could be seeing it Sh- yet in five weeks' time. Who knows? In a relegation oh, playoff. How, how could I possibly tee you up for that the way I did just there? <laughs> Absolutely awful. Um, there's plenty of jerseys at orgoretro.com that support the um, Irish independent uh, company there. Uh, use the promo code our game and you'll get 15% off. So much coming up on the show today. We'll be looking at all the games, the All-Ireland Under-20 final, as well as obviously all the senior stuff, all the lower tier finals. They were on in Crow Park over the weekend. We're also going to have Colin Galvin, the former uh, Clare star and All-Star of 2013, on the show. Most of all, get your comments in. We love hearing from you. And actually, I suppose I might as well go to a couple of them straight away. Um, Matthew Delaney, Shane, can you find out why on Sunday morning at 8.30 there were no stand tickets for Turles on Ticketmaster unless you went to, wanted to sit down in the corner yet there were empty seats everywhere? I'm not sure if you knew about that, Michael. You were in at the stadium. I wasn't at the stadium. but um... No, it looked... Uh, listen, it looked full from where I was, but until you actually go down and you know scour the stand, you can't, you can't really see. It's a strange one. It's the same as even... I look at the snooker and you see like free tickets in the Crucible and you can't. It doesn't make sense. And I don't know why you weren't able to buy. I, I don't know why that. I don't know if it's anything to do with uh, the Kilkenny Limerick game. Potentially, some of those seats actually been sold for the Kilkenny for the Kilkenny Limerick under twenty game, and then maybe those seats were were vacated by some of those people who left. But the ticket has actually been sold already. I don't. I don't. I don't know. But the two stands were pretty full anyway by throwing time. But I have to say. Uh, again, mostly Cork, mostly red everywhere, and I'd say tip were outnumbered again, four to one. Um, and Every just, single game this yeah. year in the championship, Tipperary have been outnumbered on the sideline. There's no doubt about it. Belief is on the floor. You know, a lot of people criticising the supporters for not going to the games. Again, get get your thoughts in because he like Cork fairly travelled for this game, in relatively speaking. But actually, funnily enough, the week before down at Walsh Park, Cork didn't travel. So, you know, and that was something that I had a private message sent to me by a diehard Cork supporter. So there seems to be a bit of an issue with that in terms of fair weather supporting at the moment. I just look at, by the way, I'll look at the comments in a second, but something that really stuck out to me over the weekend was the, the score lines put up. They were, they were cricket-like scores, like Galway scoring 27 points is grand, but that actually paled in comparison to the likes of Westmead with 524, Clare with 331, Cork with 330. Kerry got 29, Down 228, Kildare 229, Tyrone 127, Loud 327. There used to be a time when scoring, you know, 20 points, 25 points. That was going to win you, win you a game. It's not really anymore. No, mi- like minimum 30 you're looking at now. And it was it was funny, with about 15 minutes to go, I thought Cork could break all scoring records against Tipperary at, at one stage. And I thought they were hungry for goals after Tim O'Mahony got his goal. I think that made it, was a 327. That was on the sixty third minute, and I thought this this could be four thirty five, you know, if if they want if they wanted to be, but in, but in fairness, there was a, a bit of resistance from Tip and probably a bit of bit of cork taking their foot off the pedal, but you know, just from a Tip point of view, to be conceding the score that they conceded to deliver such a limp display, all of this after scoring one three in the first six minutes. And looking like you know, looking like they were going to hit them with everything. Then all of a sudden, Noel McGrath's penalty is you know hits the post, and 20, 28 seconds later, the ball is in the net at the other end with, with Alan Conley. And all of a sudden, the gate the game has completely shifted. But just from a from a tip point of view, uh, as I said, just a really like limp performance. Where do you take the positives? Are there is there an are there any positives out of that performance? I don't think or uh, Colin Bonner didn't seem to think so. Thought. Maybe just like I thought, Rona Mar tried very hard in the face in the face of a lot of adversity and balls been pumped down on top of him. Uh, Connor Staked and probably tried hard around the middle of the field. Noel McGrath obviously tries hard every day. Jason Ford was was good coming back from injury, but Jesus, I think positives are fairly thin on the ground. It's your biggest defeat to Cork in Championship since nineteen forty two. Tip have lost lost all four Munster Round Robin games. They've lost their last six Championship games. They, like I'm just uh, like from uh, uh, like asking you like as a supporter number one, this is the lowest tip I've been since in your lifetime. 
Well, since the 2012 All Ireland semi final against Kilkenny, you know that was you know Declan Ryan and you know Tommy Dunn was coach that day. That was that was really low. That was low as a snake's belly type stuff. Last 25 minutes, you know, trying to watch through that was desperate, and it was fairly similar in this game here. And it's not like Cork are the best team in the country and have been winning loads of All Irelands coming into it. Everyone had dismissed Cork two weeks ago, and now Tipperary are getting battered out the gate in their home turf. I mean, if you want to say what were the positives, you'd say, yeah, there's a couple of lads there who, you know, clearly have a bit of talent and a couple of lads have gotten game time this year. But you came away from it just wondering, like, what has been achieved this year? Like, you couldn't not play those players anyway because certain lads had retired. So as a matter of course, all of those guys were going to be playing anyway. So you had to ask yourself, what was, uh, what was achieved in terms of game plan this year? Do we now know what Tip are going to be doing next year? We've no idea. There, there is no nothing obvious about the game plan. I don't know what Tipperary are actually trying to do. Like Colin Bonner said, we're in shock. Our hearts are just sunk here after the game. And, you know, that kind of spoke for basically the county in general. Everyone was in shock at how bad it was. Like, you go through the collapses in games, right? Against Waterford, at the start of the second half, Waterford went on a run of two seven to three points. Against Clare, midway during the first half, Clare went a run of 3-6 three, to 3 points, including 2-3 in a row. Against Limerick, Limerick went on a run of 2-8 to 4 points in the last 17 minutes plus injury time. And then Cork went on two massive bursts here. During the first half, a run of 2-13 to 3 points. And in the second half, a run of 1-9 to 4. And then, of course, when I was saying this to you as we were preparing for the show, you mentioned the 16-point the tur- the turnaround against Limerick last year. And the question is, I wonder, how can Tip go from a team that, fine, there was that huge turnaround against Limerick last year, but ultimately lost the game by five points and were very competitive for nice spells of either side of, you know, that 16-point turnaround. So there's that running theme now of midway through games. There's a point where the other team will absolutely turn the screw. Tipperary won't be able to find a way to stem the bleeding. No one even going around with the old Nicky Quaid contact lens sort of spiel and how can tip look this unfit compared with last year because you know i've no doubt but that the players are given everything when they're out in the field the majority of the time i'm sure there's an isolated incident or two where players heads drop and they don't do the right thing because cork were just running all over to the last uh well <laughs> last 50 45 minutes of the game but they, there was times early in the game where i, I was like Tipperary looked gassed here and players that didn't look gassed last year in any of the championship games, like one or two of the older players, yeah, they looked like they were fading late on in games. But like 20 minutes into the game, there's lads who are still in their 20s who were bent over in their haunches, who were, you know, they were red in the face. And I just, I'm like, is that what sort of quality of training is going on? What, what's the SNC? So like, did you look at the Tipperary team and think, wow, athletically here, there's a fair difference between them and Cork here, even compared with last year alone? Like some of the same players compared to last year alone. And that suggests what happened over the winter. Yeah, after about 20, 25 minutes, I thought they looked out on their feet, some of them. Um, they were actually down in their hunkers. They were kind of keel, keeling over almost, some of them, which is just, a, it's mad to think that. It, it definitely, it's a, a part to do with condition, 100%. It's also part to do with your mindset, I think, and confidence levels been on the floor. Do you know when you're not playing, you know when you're not playing particularly well? You could have trained quite hard, but you're not playing particularly well. And then all of a sudden you're kind of thinking, oh jeez, I don't know how fit I am here. Um, I don't know if I have the work done. And then all of a sudden everything just spirals and it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, and you could have a lot of, you know, decent training done, but you just probably don't have the confidence. Tip had you know, their conference was eroded after that, after that penalty miss. The game just completely turned, as you say. Cork went in a score and burst. And Tip just weren't able, weren't able to keep up with them. They were chasing shadows thereafter, really. And Cork were playing around them. Um, you know, Tip weren't able to get in, get any big hits in. They weren't able to put pressure on Cork. The pressure, you know, you need to, you have to put pressure on Cork. You have to, you know... You have to, I suppose, question their touch. You have to question whether they're able to do things under pressure. Tip weren't able to do that yesterday at all. And, yeah, as I, I just thought in the last 15 or 20 minutes, it could, could have been an absolute massacre. That's not to say it wasn't a massacre in, in you know, in relative terms because it was, but that could have been 17 or 18 points easily, 
yesterday easily uh, and in fairness at least they were able to keep the scoreboard tipping off tipping over it's not mad to think that you could score 124 and be absolutely annihilated in a cha- in a championship game and that's basically what happened yesterday it's probably as you said it's probably a running team that we've seen in in recent years um you can you can put up big scores but the scores that have been conceded at the other end like Leash are putting up some decent scores the last couple of years even Westmead as well and still shipping quite big defeats that's just the way Hurling is gone now and you cannot uh, allow teams to run through you like I, I, I couldn't believe Dara Fitzgibbon was just allowed the freedom of the park for that for that goal absolutely bonkers one person meets him at the 45 and he's to tip the ball over the bar nobody meets him he must have just been like I'm, going to, I'm just going to stay going, stay going and going. Gets his strike off about 16, 17 metres out. Ron Amar kind of dived across him, looked like it went through his legs, looked like Barry Hogan was maybe slightly on sight. I think it went through his legs as well. But that's like, that's the exact same thing that happened with John Conlon for Clare as well. The whole field just opens up in front of him. And like, that's that's just not good enough yet. Like, you, co- you, coach, you coach lads to, you, you, well, you definitely always say, meet the man that's coming. That's not to say you totally abandon your own man, but you meet the man that's coming. Uh, make him pass you or make him pass the ball. Make him make another play to force a possible mistake. I just couldn't believe what, what I was looking at there yesterday. And even just uh, Fitzgibbon's flick across for Tim O'Matney's flick goal as well. Oh. Like, like that's, a, that's an embarrassing goal to concede. That, But it is an embarrassing... Like, they're playing with you basically there. And that, that's what it was. And that's, you know, that's how much superior Cork were yesterday. Yeah, look, we we can, like we obviously have to emphasize how brilliant Cork were to go to another, you know, your longtime rivals' home turf and put up three thirty is quite exceptional, and they're they're firmly back on track. What that means for later in the season, we'll talk about a little bit more. Can I just say on that, Shane, as well, how Cork are the first team to lose their first two round robin games and get through. Like everything was against Cork, you would say. Uh, you would say the you know the narrative around them, confidence on the floor. And they go to Walsh Park and produce a brilliant performance. They go to Semple Stadium. Like, maybe we're even doing them a disservice in a way. Like, what they've done, and to go and win two away games, and with the whole Ed Sheeran debacle as well. So many things were stacked against them from the league final onwards. And they've managed to turn things around uh, phenomenally. And they're a dangerous beast going into the going into the back door now. Yeah, they really are. Like Connor Lehan, seven points from play and another. Who was another on? Spring. Who was like? Can I just say, can I just add on that? Who was actually marking him? Like I know they were rotating. And, there were, but so like, you couldn't come put on. it down. To, you couldn't yeah. put it down to any one man. But like this feeds into a point I wanted to make in that Cork players several times either spilled the ball or were held up in a tackle by you know w- one person in a Tipperary jersey. So that obviously, like, if, if, you're, if you're tackling someone, like you, you've been a defender throughout your life, if you tackle someone and stop him up or force him to turn, you're then expecting support to come in straight away, aren't you? Because you're yeah. like, this will be my reward for getting that tackle in. Someone will help me out. Or I knock the ball out of someone's hand. Someone will be there to pick it up. Tipperary players were so disjointed. They were not hunted in packs. That's the whole thing. You have to hunt in packs in hurling and, and Gaelic football and I suppose in all sports in a way. And that it just did not happen. So whether that was like how disorganized they were, the lacking in fitness, the lacking in belief, lads not, you know, given absolutely everything, maybe in the odd occasion, I don't know. But Tipperary had no real idea of how to work as a unit. Like even with the short pockets that Cork worked out, the amount of times that someone would hit a ball across to the cornerback, he'd take, move it on a few yards, then move it across. And maybe somebody like Coleman would be shown for it in the middle. And a Tipperary inside forward, rather than working his way across to, to ensure that Coleman couldn't receive the ball, instead just stayed looking at it. The ball would go to Coleman then, and he could end up, you know, doing whatever he liked with it. Some of those puck outs that uh, Patrick Collins was able to put into the middle of the field, and the likes of, you know, Dara Fitzgibbon ends up for his goal. I think it was just a straight puck out, uh, and either someone handed it to him or he just turned and ran straight in. It was like puck outs picking out somebody who's 30 yards in space almost in their half forward line it was beyond belief so if you were to ask me do i look at tipperary and think well look it's building towards something it's building towards nothing i mean you know like colin bonner said afterwards like you know that he's in shock and all that kind of stuff and you know he's a gent of a man anytime i've spoken to him ever but i can't ima- i would imagine he's come away from this wondering do you know do i do i fancy a, another year like am, am i going in the right direction and 
I'd say the management team is probably looking at it thinking, I'm not sure that, you know, that this is right for us. Like, yeah. do you look at it and think, like, I look at it and I think this isn't going anywhere. And we nearly have to say, you know, let's call a spade a spade here. This isn't working. I know there are lots of reasons, retirements. Look, no one made more excuses for them than me because I didn't want to just be the person hammered. But, like, go through the year, who have Tipperary beaten? Leash and struggle to beat Leash in the league. Kilkenny, two terrible teams that day in Turles in the league and Antrim. So, other than that, lost to Kerry, lost to Dublin, Waterford, Waterford again, Clare, Limerick, Cork. So, where is this going? Yeah, the like, evidence, you tell me. Yeah. Like, answer that directly yourself. Like, well, I wasn't. Sure. I, I, I'm confused as to what way Tipperary are trying to, to play. Uh, whether there's any pattern to the play, whether they're caught between trying to do several different things but actually doing not doing nothing at all in in a way. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I probably question some of the coaching maybe that's going on, and you know they don't look like the most well coached team on the pitch. That's just my own opinion looking at it. Um. And as you, you know, really, when you put the when you put the results there, the results do not stand up. Like, like you don't, yeah, you know the way you don't see what what's building. You know, if you see something building, you're you know you're thinking oh, next year things could you know fall into place a bit more. Like, well, to, to be fair, I probably didn't see much building with Limerick in twenty seventeen, and look what look what happened there. But they at least they were it looked like they were trying to play to some sort of a style or a pattern. I don't know what way. Tipperary are playing is that I couldn't believe like when Conor Lahan got his third point yesterday you'd imagine someone just marks him someone just picks him up and you, if you have to follow him everywhere he goes then you follow him everywhere he goes you can't just let him take six shots in the first half and score six points and you know not really be under any pressure for the, for those six shots really there were basically five of them were absolute carbon copies of each other it was which was b bizarre to look at really um I don't know. I, I thought Colin Bonner looked a, a beaten man when when we interviewed him in the in the dressing room yesterday. I thought he was he was fairly low after the Limerick game as well. And if you look at it, Tip produced a performance of such against Waterford that, that form has worked out absolutely horribly. Um, a no show against Clare, a no show against Cork yesterday, and they were very competitive against Limerick, a Limerick side that maybe it looks more like that they had that the handbrake wasn't even off in that game. So. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how you. I'm not sure how you stack it up. But I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be too surprised if there was if there was a change in the off season. Being honest, and that's probably not. It's they're not the only county that we're going to talk about where that's a realistic possibility either. Yeah, comments are flying in here at a rate of knots. Um, I'll get go through a couple of them here. Uh, let's see. I'll start off with um. Uh, okay, Davy Fitz should be in Dublin tomorrow. He's the only one that can get a tune out of a limited orchestra. Uh, let's see, I'm moving down a small bit more. Watford uh, scored 28 points and we're still hockeyed. Adrian McGrath, Brian Lohan has built on a really good squad. There are a crop of really good lads from 16 to 22 that no one outside Clare are aware of yet. We're in a good place. Does Shane uh, see any more tip retirements coming like Bonner and Bonner Maher, Shames Callan and Noel McGrath? You never know. It'll obviously be up to the lads themselves, but... Um, yeah, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Claire scored 31 points and had 20 wides. Uh, let's see. Some leaks coming from Watford. Hurlers, uh, Hurler and the Ditch had team information from Limerick and Clare Games positional setups. If player coaches can't keep them out closed, what hope do we have? Uh, is the tip job too big for Colin Bonner? Going from Carlos to tip is a massive setup. I hope Liam Cahill goes to tip and Daryl Sullivan takes Watford. We'll both be better off, says Sean O'Sullivan. Park Gill said at the start of the year that relegation is a worry for tip. There would be no guarantees against Kerry right now. Also, Bonner was set up as a patsy for years of neglect, not bringing through Ruth, uh, youth. Um, it's quite funny now, looking back on how angry Waterford were at Shane that night. He suggested that the Limerick game was a massive missed opportunity. And uh, Shane spoke the truth that night, and the chickens came home to roost. Also, Park Gill, as lads who have played, uh, you know yourselves you are fit, but a team is running rings around you, and you're chasing shadows, and you look unfit. Obviously referring to the Cork against um, Tipperary game there. We might as well have a listen to a little clip of Kieran Kingston, who was talking about the change in Cork that we've been referring to, beaten in their first two championship games, did not look good at all, and they've really turned it around since. It's what the league, the league in itself, like we, we, we ran from game to game and, and then not in any way making excuses, but we didn't have a lot of time to tweak or change. And when, we, when you got a bit of a run in the league, you're kind of sticking with the same maybe and stuff in the way you're doing things and the way you're training and whatever and we didn't get a chance to do a bit of a block um, we tweaked things since then 
we got harsh lessons and uh, um, a lot of lessons learned in those in the league final, the first two championship matches. But I think the key thing, um, I don't know if Mark mentioned it or not, but we spoke about it, that even after losing those three big games in a row, um, the group never panicked. Uh, the players didn't panic. We didn't panic. Um, they believed in, in what we were doing. We believed in, what, in the group we have. And um, I think it has united the group, actually, in a funny sort of way. I think... Um, uh, the group, and when I say the group, I mean players and management. I think they're a lot tighter than maybe they were three or four weeks ago, and and losses like that. And I think it showed the last two games. Yeah, he's. Um, I suppose we kind of all felt that this was pretty much near in the end of the road, but all of a sudden Cork have turned it around and justified the belief I had in them at the start of the year. <laughs> <laughs> it's a the, the belief. Your belief in Cork is slight. Like it's such a. A bitter pill, like you're you're taking, you know, a victory for Cork yesterday. Your long game following the last couple of years, they annihilate your native tip, and you're trying to find some po- you're trying to find some positives in it. Fair play to you. Uh, if you can paint a good picture on that, if that makes you happy on this bleak Monday morning, well then, so so be it. But uh, they definitely look like they're turning things around. Um, look so much more confident in their play. Um, like Conor Lahan, who's obviously. Yeah, one of the elder statesmen, despite not being on the panel uh, last year, like, he's just really stood up the last two games. Harnady was probably quieter at stages yesterday, but you know, really had a really good second half in particular. Got a couple of really good scores. Looked kind of fired up. Was even having having a go at the referee at different stages over decision, which just shows shows that that you really care and you want to you want to make change. And yeah, I just think they're really, they are a dangerous prospect going into the into the back door. Do I do I still have faith in them? Um, you've you say you've always had you've always had faith in this Cork team. My faith is still questionable in them. Been honest with you. Um, I still think I still think there's a ceiling to them. I'll put I'll put it to you that way. But they're in they're in the hunt anyway. Now they've an away they've an away game in that preliminary All Ireland quarter final against the Joe McDonald champions. They'll be either going up to Ballycastle or they'll be going down to Tralee probably. Um, you'd fa- you'd fancy them to get through either. Um, and probably listen, I'd probably fancy them to get through a quarter final against someone as well. It's just thereafter, I think where where they might struggle. But they've definitely turned things around really well. Tim O'Matney came in again yesterday, full forward, uh, made made a big made a big difference. Just one player in particular, like Kieran Joyce, is such a, you know, he's such an old hand nearly at this stage. He looks like a lad that's been there for eight, for ages. This is first inter county season at senior level, um, and then what I really like about him is he opens his shoulders a lot, and I think he's allowed to open his shoulders now, whereas he he mightn't have been maybe a couple of weeks ago. He wants to deliver kind of long ball in. They have Coleman back playing well, looks an awful lot happier and freer in his role. They have Fitzgibbon back playing well too. Um, and loads of different forwards chipping in. And then Alan Conley, four goals in three games, gives him that attack and threat uh, that maybe they were lacking up until this point. He's not no longer coming in off the bench trying to make an impact. And you know what? He's a good ball winner as well. And they have the option, particularly when him and Omani are in there, that they can actually pump a ball in. And and think that they're going to hold ball or create a goal chance from from that type of scenario. So they have mixed it up a bit as well. But there's no point in saying any different. The the uh, the work rate and the work ethic has been up massively. Like Shane Kingston travelled about hundred yards to get to get a block in down the down the Orean sideline yesterday. Just something you probably wouldn't have seen um a few weeks ago. Probably just a little mentality shift. And Kingston said as well that the obituaries have been written for them. Um. And you know they, they've they've kind of they're ripping up the script now. While probably just tinkering their own script and their style of play, they've ripped up that narrative now. And he says there as well, they do look more united. Sometimes you know yourself a good uh, a good hoo ha behind closed doors. You say me calling you out, you calling me out, and maybe having harsh words and maybe not necessarily coming close to blows. But that all stays behind closed doors. Once you once you exit, then you're a team and you're united, and it definitely looks like that's what Cork are now. Which is quite different to the leaks that are coming out of the Waterford dressing room, which we'll come back to in a little while. But Cork had ten different scores who got at least two points. I mean, that in itself is a very very damning stat for Tipperary, and obviously very good for Cork. Uh, Patrick Horgan, he scored one of his from play, got five overall. Again, taken off. This time he was taken off after forty four minutes, and you know Tim O'Mahony had a big impact. I do wonder if it's coming to that stage now where the, the script might be flipped in terms of who's starting and who's coming on. You know, obviously Patrick Horgan has 
been such a fantastic player, but you can kind of see more and more that it feels like it's moving in direction in the direction now of uh, Tim O'Mahony starting. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I like there was a couple of times when Cork had the option of a long kind of an out ball, and Horgan wasn't actually making the run a lot of the time. And I, I don't know if that's to do with maybe not having the legs to, or he doesn't feel like he has the legs to get out there. But when O'Mahony is in there, he ha you have that option of hitting it long. You have the option of throwing a ball down on the edge of the square and potentially getting something off it. So, like, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if potentially in the next, maybe not the next day, but maybe in the all Ireland quarter final, if Horgan is the one potentially coming in off the bench. Yeah, and I thought the look of joy on Tim O'Mahony's face when he flicked in that goal was, <laughs> it was kind of half funny. He was just, he was just like from ear to ear smiling, just couldn't be uh, more delighted with how things had gone for him there. Um, let's see, uh, there's something else I wanted to, to bring up. Yeah, but even that Alan Connolly thing, isn't it interesting that it didn't really work out for him against Limerick and he's just gone on to do everything that he's done ever since. Like he, he really does look like a player that's ready to to kick on to the next gear for for Cork this year. Definitely, yeah, and like some, sometimes like probably you know exposed to you know the harshest opposition against Limerick, probably learned an awful lot. Didn't seem to dent his confidence, which is which is huge. He's been able to bounce back straight away, and yeah, he just like even I thought he I thought he was brilliant for his goal. He actually threw the ball out in front of himself almost to make sure he wouldn't get wouldn't get hooked as well. Uh, I thought you know he's a real kind of a poacher there, but he's also. Um, he's also for a diminutive enough fella. He's, a, he's like he's a strong boy. Oh, he like you could you could you could put a high ball in on top of him, even though he's not particularly big, and you still feel he's a good chance of winning. And so he off, there's there's a few lads offering them something different. And while we're talking about you know maybe a long ball going into Tim O'Mahony, maybe a long ball going into Connolly, they haven't ripped up the script either. They've just uh, fine tuned it a small bit, I suppose, as well. And you add in a greater work ethic across the pitch, and maybe your your probably your elder statesman, your leaders like Conor Lahan and uh, like Conor Lahan and Seamus Harney. Oh yeah, and Fitzgibbon open their game, open the energies, and probably taking other players with them as well. Um, yeah, it's 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 encouraging for them, and it's it'll be interesting to see what they can do now. Like sometimes. Like the, the psychological damage of last year's All Ireland final, uh, the league final loss, the Limerick loss, um, even losing losing to Clare as well. Like is like have they have they eventually come out the other side of that now? Pot That's potentially, I'm I'm still I'm still not totally sold, but it, there, there's a potential that they've seen their lowest lows and they've come through it and they're more united than ever. And that they could really do something from here on. I'm not 100% sure, but the potential is definitely there. Yeah, uh, on our Thursday show, uh, we sp spoke with Richie Power and Kieran Carey, as we do every week. We were talking about the whole Horgan issue, and here's a little clip of, of talking about it. I don't know even to crank it up another notch, but only time will tell. Will they do that? You know, because as I said, you know, Fitzgibbon on his day, you know, is outstanding. Coleman the same, Harmony the same, you know, Luke Mead, you know, they have a lot of quality and a lot of hurlers. You know, they're just this particular year. They're just their level of inconsistency has has, has kind of caught up to them, but they're still back in the fray at the minute. What do you make of the the Patrick Horgan situation, Richie? Can you understand why it was done, and do you think he'll start against Tip? Um, I do understand why it was done, Shane. You know, um, I suppose. Look, we we all know how how good pa Patrick Horgan has been over the years. Um, you know, however many years, I'm not sure. However, you know how many he's been with Cork seniors. But I suppose the big thing for Patrick was he he became the the highest scorer in in championship history on on Sunday, which is a massive achievement for him. But you know, I don't think he will start against Tip. Um, I think they will look at the impact Tim O'Mahony had. Um, you know. Patrick's wrist work, his movement is still great, but for me, I just don't think the the speed and the legs, the legs are there anymore to to last seventy minutes. And I think that's what what will come down to. Um, like, look, what a great guy to have on the bench to come on with twenty, maybe twenty five minutes to go to try and turn a game or try and win a game. But I think he might be better seen to that light and um, going forward for this Cork team if you know if they want to lay down a marker on Sunday and going forward in this championship because you know obviously. As I said, a fantastic free taker, great wrists when he gets the ball in his hand. But I just don't think that, you know, that burst of energy or that burst of speed is there anymore. Like he's 34 years of age um, he's a lot of miles on the clock. So I think he'd be better used as an impact sub um, to try and come on and maybe change a game or win a game. So um, 
But look, that's not taking anything from Patrick. See the full yeah, video. Yeah, only. So, uh, obviously that was that was last week's show. And if you want to catch more of that, go to patreon.com forward slash our game. And there'll be loads loads of goodness with Kieran and Richie every week. It's uh, it's always a very enjoyable show. By the way, Danny Mack has the boot in for you here. Best panel in the country, Waterford, Mr. Verney. Oh, but sure, listen, we all have opinions. Some of them are right, <laughs> some of them are some of them are wrong. I did think I did think after when the Bally Gunner lads come back in, I'm thinking, you know, and then the after the league final, like that I I think it's an opinion that was probably shared by a fair few. Then all of a sudden it looks it just looks like the energy has been sucked out of Waterford. We'll go into them, I'm sure, a bit more uh later on with talking about the leaks in the camp and even whether whether Liam Cattle is going to be there next year or not. Just amazing how you know how things have changed in the last six or seven weeks in Waterford. Optimism was at, a, at an all time high. Now, in some quarters, it was probably far too high. And, like, you know, Derek McGrath saying that Waterford, whoever beats Waterford will go up the steps, is totally, to me, it's totally unwanted pressure and unwanted hype around the squad when you have a big name and a former manager who's dealt with these players saying that type of thing. And I'm sure it's probably something that Liam Cattle wasn't probably too happy about um, privately, I'd say. But I, there, like you just, there has to be more to what's going on in Waterford. To me, it's not just you know, you know, they can't just be gone over the top. They can't just have put all their energy into the league. That's definitely Cal has not intimated that at all. He kind of said we had a good run in the league once we thought there was a chance of silverware there. We said we go for it, but they didn't go gung ho for the league or anything like that. So I don't know exactly what's happened in Waterford, but. It's interesting, it's, you know, saw a comment this morning, which county is the bigger post-mortem, Tipperary or Waterford, over the, over the coming months? And it, I, like Waterford's expectations were were high. Tips were pretty low. Now, tips tip have gone down lower, whereas Waterford are up here and they're gone they're so low now. So, yeah, listen, I'm sure it's something we'll go into a bit more in a few minutes. Yeah, well, actually, it was interesting. I put a tweet up last night saying which inter-county team is most likely to have a different manager next season. And the amount of people that posted their own county, Grania Foley says Dublin, Matty Kenny year is over. Hope they don't go for Davy, Leash and Tip also. Uh, I'd say the biggest one will be Kilkenny, says John Walsh. Uh, tip of a sh- This is Derek Ken- Kennedy. Tip should have accepted Cahill's very reasonable suggestions in order to give him the job for the year. They may do, do so in the off-season. Dublin, for sure, says Mick Ryan. Uh, Niall Ryan says, what could Banner have do, uh, di- and could he have done differently? Geraldine Carey, Dublin, and then maybe Cork. Um, you see Tipperary mentioned, Waterford, Waterford, Leash, hopefully. Kilkenny, can't see uh, Liam Cahill staying. Offaly mentioned, Meath mentioned. It's interesting. I, the thing that really stood out to me is there's talk of nearly every, <laughs> most counties there in a way. John Kiley obviously not being mentioned. Brian Lohan, rightly not being mentioned. But everyone else seems to be getting a shout. Yeah, it was very. Um, I think last year was the busiest um, inter county off season. With part of it was the Liam Cal, Willie Wanty, and who would end up Tipperary manager thereafter. Um, I suppose even whether Brian Cody would stay on and, and a few more in. But this year could be busier again. I'd say it could be the busiest inter county uh, off se- off season of all time. But a lot of people probably uh, disappointed with how their counties have have gone out of gone out of championship. A lot of just you know Waterford limped out at the weekend, Tipperary limped out, Waterford went out, dis- or Offaly went out disappointingly in the McDonough Cup, having got themselves into a really, really good position as well. But can I just say something, Shane, on the Tipperary thing? Like, would anyone have predicted at the end of 2019, when, you know, Waterford were atrocious throughout the Munster Championship, that Waterford would be in the All-Ireland final a year later, and be in the All-Ireland semi-final year after, and win a league title? You know, I'm just saying, things can turn... I, I'm a big believer and I don't I don't put all I don't put all of it on the players, I don't put all of it on management. But when things are right and people totally buy in, things can turn around. Look at Claire Hurlan in general, not just the senior team, the twenties, the minors. The minors are beating forty points by Cork last year, and then they're beaten in, you know, a penalty shootout in a Munster final. When things are right and the mood is right and people totally buy in at every level, players, management, supporters, things can turn quite quickly. Look at Offaly, like I just mean as a county in general. Look how Offaly have turned things in the last two or three years. The twenties win in All Ireland, the seniors win in the Christie Ring, the footballers getting promoted, the minors win in the Ireland. Things can happen quickly when I suppose when the right when the right people are involved and people buy into it. Yeah, I mean, 
it's just that at senior, like at underage level, and I think if you're at lower tiers, I think you can probably turn that around quickly. But at senior level, you look at the Tipperary players and like the way they're puffing and panting, that's not something that in the gym or, or S&C or whatever that you can fix in the space of a few weeks or a few months. They look a nice bit off the, off the mark. And like if you compare it with Limerick, who obviously they competed with well for 65 minutes, it, it just looks like they're a team that's done years upon year and they're just layering more muscle and more conditioning on top of it. Whereas, And then if you go to the game plan side of things, Tipperary just look a mile off it because you just don't know what they're trying to do. At Limerick, it feels like they're always finessing what they're doing and they're taking it to the next level. And I look at the way Clare played over the weekend and how they worked the ball up the field. It's like, And this is obviously dipping into their panel a nice bit in terms of like Tony Kelly and John Cannon not being there. And you're seeing what they're doing and how they're building. And that's something that's been happening for three years. Whereas Tip now, you just you feel like it's completely back to square one. A couple of the performances were decent. So there, there's it's not like there's no players there. But it just so it, it, you'd just be quite disillusioned looking at that performance. And uh, the comments keep coming in here. Bert Giggles, Ash Tiger says, that's five monster teams, including Kerry. Uh, Parik Gill again, a very costly All-Ireland flash. Uh, Shane talks of Clare's fluke, uh, All-Ireland in 2013. But 2019 was gift wrapped for Tip, thanks to Kilkenny doing all the work beating Limerick. Uh, Porter Porter, we won uh, the 2019 All-Ireland. End of story. Limerick lost to a better team. Deal with it. SSRI, one super club doesn't help a county team, i.e. Waterford. Obviously, he's referring to Bally Gunner there. Uh, Sharp 21 or 2 U1 says, Waterford proved one thing. They can't do it when they have to. Since the round robin was brought in, Waterford have only one win. Why doesn't this format uh, not suit? Why does this format not suit Waterford? That's an interesting one. Yeah, I saw, I think, Conor McKenna was tweeting last night saying that Waterford have won two of their last 17 Munster Championship games, which is like... You know, it's, it's, it's scarcely believable that you would be saying something like that at the start of Munster this year, particularly when the big tip. The like guy was like, I, I think I said it. I've no, point, no problem putting have an egg in my face. I think I said it after the tip game that that was the perfect scenario for Liam Cattle, that they'd played badly and still won a game and maybe with all the hype after league final. There has to be more going on there, Shane. There, there, just, there just has to be. Uh, the leaks included, and even I think, you know, Jamie Barron, like while coming off injured, they like cut a particularly frustrated figure, you know, throwing his helmet and even that kind of thing. That's not what we're used to from him. Um, so I don't know if that's going to play out. And no, you have you have audio from Liam Cattle there that kind of. Well, I throw it up now. Yeah, I just it. I let I think maybe let people um make their own judgment on whether they think he'll be there next year or not based on this maybe. Um. You know, it's today's today's obviously, as I said, very very disappointing. Um, it's something that we won't make a, a rash decision on now. But um, you know, you'd have to say from my side, like you know, I just wonder what else can be done really to to, to bring him to bring these guys to the next level. I'm not sure. I'm I'm, I'm quite happy to sit down with these, these players. I have a very very good healthy relationship with every one of these players. They're, they're extremely honest men and and. Um, you know, before I do anything, I'll definitely sit down with them and, and, and see where their heads are at first before we do anything uh, too rash. So that sound, sounds like a joint manager-player meeting. That everyone needs to sit down, talk honestly, and see where are we going with this thing. Yeah, it does, and it's funny. Um, like I'm, I'm not saying that Liam Cahill has lost the dressing room or anything, anything like that. But it just it's a scenario after the league final and even at the end of last year when he committed to Waterford that you wouldn't even envisage happening in time, that it's gonna be like a, a meeting with players. Um you know, we talk about like we probably want managers to make it, you know, give us a quote straight after a match, but you, you can't be you can't be rash. You need to let the dust settle over the next couple of weeks. You need to let lads maybe be a bit freer a freer in their mind before they make a decision. Funny, Colin Bonner said the same thing. We asked him yesterday whether he'd, you know, whether Tip would train on for the Kerry game, which potentially potential could happen. Game. Yeah, potential game could happen in five five weeks if Kerry win the Joe McDonough, there'd be a playoff game. And like I don't think that's a conversation you're going to have with the tip lads in the dressing room after being beaten by 12 points by Cork. Do you know, realistically, and he, he pretty much said as much. That's a conversation you have probably the, the morning after the McDonough final if Kerry win and you get the you get things back back moving again. But um, yeah, just it's a, it's mad to think when we we're talking about the off-season and the potential of Cattle going to Tipperary and obviously Tipperary having talks with Cattle and now, you know, 
Tipperary are out of the championship and Waterford are out of the championship and both limped out of the championship. It's just not something you would have foreseen anyway. And on that as well, you wouldn't have foreseen Clare doing what they did without Tony Kelly and, and John Conlon. Like, that's so impressive. I, I didn't see much of that game because it was down in Semple yesterday. Going to watch it during the week. But for them to be hit two or 331 in a championship game, regardless of what Waterford showed up and what their mentality was, without their, you know, their two main men, really. So impressive. Such a good sign for the health of their squad. Really, really is. And he's kept momentum, Shane. While, while resting Kelly and Conlon, he's managed to keep the momentum. And, like, if anything, they're in an even better position going into the Munster final now. Who would have said that Clare would top the Munster round robin? Like, you know, it's few, some you know, if any, like it is some going like three thirty one to Waterford's two twenty two, and they were up by twenty points at one stage. This wasn't just a, a you know a victory. This was a beatdown. Tipperary obviously suffered something similar, but you know this was fairly cringe for an awful lot of the game. It's interesting that both monster games kind of went that way. Uh, you know, as, as the game was going on, you were just like, please make it end. You know, it, it was awful, and obviously. Um, Liam Cahill had to rejig things. He had Austin Gleeson in the back line, lost Tyg de Burka very early in the game. Then he lost Jamie Barron, who interestingly he started in the full forward line. You know, we, we talked about this before. Would they try something different like that, like moving Jamie Barron up there? Because you could see how it might work. But, you know, when you have injury after injury and the team, you know, the team that would have played in the league final and it just looks so different to the team now, or I suppose even the league semi-final when Austin Gleeson was playing in the forward line, he was looking so dominant. They just look like a real cohesive unit. And you know, the way we had said that players who looked like they were, you know, where were they going with their careers? All of a sudden, they seem to be hitting that um, level where they were fulfilling their ambition. And lads who you thought, ah, he's only okay. These lads were becoming very good worker B type players. And there was a cohesion to them, but the team was just so changed around. And I'm not picking on any player in particular, but just in terms of like how different it was from the start of the, the league, like Ian Kenny's back in. Uh, obviously, he'd been away with Bally Gunner, and we'd, we'd wondered where he was. So, you know, he's a good player. Uh, Mark Fitzgerald is in. You know, this is a player who probably would have been playing more games underage this year, only for a broken jaw. Um, you had uh, Park Mahoney back in towards the middle of the field. Peter Hogan was back in starting. a lot, of, And then Jamie Barron was in the full forward line, and Austin Gleeson was back in his own half of the field for a lot of it. It's just it just kind of had a disjointed feel to it, and maybe that's why, you know, there was no cohesion because players were just pulled in completely different directions. But you can understand the management saying, "Well, it hasn't worked the last few games. We have to try something different here." Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, um, it's funny like Jamie Barron going into a, f- a full forward line when when Waterford are playing well, you're really optimistic about the move. I I would be anyway. I think he could offer you know a lot in there on a given day. But when things are going badly and lads around you aren't hurling particularly well and you're not confident you're not really happy in your game it, it can just it just looks like the wheels have, have come off completely like imagine if you had said that after the league final that Stephen Bennett would not start Waterford's last Munster round robin game based on form like you would have been shot you know it just wouldn't it wouldn't have made it wouldn't have made any sense he was you know hurt in hurler the year form after the league and I suppose it just goes back to show um you know, the the massive difference between league and championship and particularly now, probably how little stock the league has now, realistically, because it's just poles, it's just poles apart. But how condensed they are, um, it's just poles apart from championship time. And uh league form has been ripped apart in the la- in the last couple of couple of weeks. Um, but just gonna be really interesting to see what happens with Liam Cal. There was a good comment in there, can't remember who it was by, where it said Liam Cal is kind of caught in two minds. He is a winner, he is a serial winner, and I'm sure he doesn't want to walk away from Waterford. But then there's the possibility of, you know, is there, you know, is it is there a disgruntled camp there now? You know, or is everybody happy within that camp? So it'd be fascinating to see how that behind closed doors meeting goes and um, if the contents of that meeting are leaked, I can guarantee you he'd be, he definitely won't be staying. Yeah, but as Richard Hogan points out here, injuries to Conor Prunty and Irla Daly were huge in key positions. You, you, you'd think that Conor Prunty would be made for Peter Duggan. Like Peter Duggan has this very interesting thing, I'm sure everyone sees it, where a high hanging ball comes in, he holds his man off and he puts the stick up in the air and he tries to touch it down to himself. Now, you, you think 
Connor Prunty would be more physically suited to just sort of coming in, bursting and spoiling the man so, so that the ball runs through either so that Prunty can get it or maybe the goalkeeper if he's close enough behind him. But players that aren't of that same size stature, it's very, very hard to deal with um, with Peter Duggan in that situation. And he's having a brilliant season. But one thing that I do notice with when he does that is very often he's sort of pinning himself and the defender into a stationary position. He touches it down to himself, but then he actually has to try and do all the work in terms of the roll lift, move, turn and go from a standing position when a player is all over him. And because he's holding him off with his, his free hand, he actually has nothing to rise it up and catch it with. Yeah. So he actually a lot of the time gets tied up in that situation. So it's a nightmare. But then the next part is how can I get this ball up quickly and either give it to someone coming through or turn and have my own shot? I think that's the next step for him. But I mean, what an addition he has been. It like, feels like we're saying it every week, but it just can't be overstated. And do, do you think that there was an element of rolling the dice even playing him for as long as they did in this game? Because, you know, you're, I think is it something like 18 times more likely to get injured in training as, or in a match as training. Maybe so, but you know, I have to like he played he came on as a sub maybe in a in a couple of league games. He's still playing catch up as is as is Shane O'Donnell. Um like you know, obviously we've seen with O'Donnell that he seems to need very little hurling to get back up to the pitch, but like they're both coming into a Munster final now in really good form. They both played they both played well throughout the campaign up until that point. We're probably quiet against Limerick, both were quiet enough against Limerick while working hard. Whereas now they're coming in, they've turned around their form a little bit again. Now Claire have this position where, you know, they've four or five lads around Tony Kelly who are in serious confident, you know, seriously confident in attack, can feel that they can all make a big impact on the scoreboard. Now, listen, it remains to be seen whether that'll happen. Maybe, you know, the pressure will come back on Kelly um, against Limerick in, in the Munster final. But, you know, they're in a fantastic position. And you have to say, like, Brian Lone is just... Like, Brian Lone is probably, you know, Hurland's quiet man at the moment. Like, he just... He, he says very little in interviews, keeps it all kind of low-key. But, like... His team, like behind closed doors, I'm sure there's like there's few more passionate, and he's got them really well organized now as well. Really, yeah. really well. Are all you know humming, singing off that kind of same hymn sheet, and I think they'll fancy. I think they'll fancy the monster final. Claire, mm -hmm. Limerick have had maybe three weeks to rest up, but potentially maybe get Keen Lynch back into the fray. I don't know if, whether that's going to be the case or not. Maybe uh, any walking wounded that they had have had a bit of time to settle up but it's going to be like i heard somebody saying you know about uh you know about them playing in ennis and they, they love playing in ennis but then now they have to go to turles or wherever or crow park like they already like rattled tipperary and turles early on this year i don't think turles is an issue for them at all like it's not as if claire don't have pace claire have pace everywhere to me like everywhere all across the pitch so like to me turles turles suits claire Crow Park suits Claire as well as you know. Maybe, I don't know if it suits him as much as Limerick. Maybe that remains to be seen. But I don't like. I don't see a bigger pitch, um, you know, on setting them at all. Definitely not. Um, they're only got. They look like they're only going to get better now as well. Yeah, Porter Porter said Lohan has done well. Damien O'H says Claire extremely dark horses now. Galway tuning up nicely. And do you know the thing about Shane O'Donnell is. You know, in 2013, burst on the scene, excellent and all that. He's always been a brilliant player, but for too often, he was playing massively outnumbered in a full forward line, often 1v2, 1v3, and still looking dangerous. And now that he's playing, I suppose a lot of the time in situations where it's 1v1, 2v2, or both teams have filled the middle area uh, with players, you're just seeing how unbelievable this guy can be. The way he's picking off puck outs in every game, I mean, go back to the tip game. He snapped a puck out in the second half, and I can't remember did he throw it over himself or assist somebody. Yeah, he did, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, like, he's doing it every game now, and he terrorized Watford in this game. And because he's got that pace, and one of our commenters here referred to how he slaloms with the ball, which I think is a, yeah, it's a it, tough cornerbacks here. He says um, he was incredible. He's like a slalom skier, the way he sweeps up the ball and weaves around tackles. Like, he really is. He's just so dynamic to watch. And when he runs through with the ball, you feel like there is seriously uh, issues for the opposition here. And what credit to him to get back into the team after suffering such a horrible 2021 with the concussion issues. Um, you just wonder, you know, could more have been got out of him throughout his career if he wasn't always so outnumbered? Like, is this the, is Brian Lohan truly, truly now getting the absolute best out of Shane O'Donnell? 
Yeah, it looks like it, Shane. Yeah, um, I that that role he was playing for many years is the most thankless role. Uh, Shane Bennett played it for Watford when they got to the All Ireland in 2017 as well. Ma- uh, Morris used to come in and play it at times as well. Uh, just a really, really, you know, you're outnumbered. You're just doing a load of donkey work. Conor McDonald played played it with Wexford probably for a long time too. He just looks totally reinvigorated now, and he he has that attacking threat now. He's no longer. Yeah, obviously they always say the first line of defense would say is your full forward line, or you know your second line is your half forward. Line. But he's no longer a defender first, almost. You know what I mean? He's an attacker now. He is. He's a creator, um, and he's a danger. And uh, having him coming into the Munster final and playing like he is, and having Duggan coming in like that, yeah, uh, getting David Reedy back, getting you know Ian Galvin back. You know, the options are, the options. Their cup run it's over at the at the moment. You'd have to say. Oh. Yeah, yeah, they're looking so good. Um, if we just go back to Waterford again, and you know, you've kind of talked about the leaks already, and you know, that is just not ideal at all. But Stephen Bennett not starting, I thought was quite, you know, again, he went through the league and uh, you know, was in superb form. I remember Tomas McCarthy uh posting about the amount of different um, the amount of uh scoring that he'd done and how incredible mm-hmm. it had been, and it was, there's no taking away from it. And he looked really dynamic, and he's been in the hurler the year conversation in previous years. So this guy's form was brilliant, but then didn't score from play in the first few games. Again, I suppose, what do you do as a manager? Do you roll the dice and say, I'm going to trust the guy to, to hit top form? Or do I roll the dice and say he won't? So I'm going I'm, I'm gonna to start somebody else and hope that he'll come in off the bench. Because also, if guys aren't playing well, and you as another player in the panel who's been trying everything for, you know, for ages and putting in all the graft, and you see that no matter what happens, that other person is always going to start. You kind of start to drop your head, and that's where you end up with a disgruntled panel. Like Lee, John Kiley won't have any issues in his panel so long as they keep winning. But when they start losing, and sorry, if they start losing, there's no guarantee Liverpool will ever be losing. But if they start losing, and then the same lads are continue to be played, then that's where there's issues. Now he might have a, a positive issue like Brian Lohan in the coming weeks when Keen uh, Lynch maybe he comes back into the fray, and all of a sudden somebody who's probably doing pretty well has to drop back to the bench. Now, I'm sure any player getting dropped will understand that, you know, Keane Lynch obviously has to be starting here because he's so good, but he'll have that positive issue. But if they start losing and, you know, key men continue to start, you know, that's where there's a problem. But I have to say, you know, like the form hadn't been unbelievable for him and it's not like he took the game over when he came in. He's a really talented player, but like most of these Watford lads, there has to be another few gears in them. And another thing I'd say is a couple of the Watford players just, you know, we say it about Tipperary is the S&C a bit of a problem. There's a couple, not many, but a couple of the Watford key players that just don't look like they're in the most conditioned form. Like, they look like they probably carry in a small little bit and they could be a little bit more lean looking. Yeah, just just on the the kind of blind loyalty, I would say, I'd always, yeah, I don't know, it, it's, it's a thin line between winning and losing. If you're winning, you can get away with picking the same players and people are less disgruntled because you're winning. But like when things are going wrong, I'd always... You know, I always like a manager that kind of shakes it up a small bit. Like you can't just have blind faith in a player if he hasn't done it in three, you know, two to three games in a row. You kind of do need to mix it up, and I think it's a it is a good sign for um, it's a good sign, a good thing for squad members anyway that they're going to get an opportunity that you're not just going to be pulling your hair out and that you can just pick out who's going to start on a given day. No, no, ma- no matter who is playing. like I, And it's funny, though, confidence is such a big thing. Like, I'm kind of hearing that, you know, a lot of the Cork lads, you know, maybe from number 20 upwards in their squad, some of them couldn't hit a barn door in training recently. The confidence was just that low. And now all of a sudden, you know, they're coming, they're coming into a team that's full of confidence. And there was lads firing over points left, right and centre yesterday. So confidence is a, is a big thing as well. And again, we don't know... We don't know what's going on behind closed doors, what's happening on the training pitch. It always, you know, you always think a manager, with some, with a player like Stephen Bennett, that a manager's always going to give him the benefit of the doubt to deliver. But he's also seen during the week whether he's delivering in training or not. He obviously felt change, changes were needed. Um, listen, it didn't work. I don't I don't think it would have mattered what they did or who they picked yesterday because Clare arrived in a different, looked like in a different mindset and Waterford looked like the race was ran before before the game even took place yesterday. For whatever reason, I don't know. And that's what's going to be fascinating. You're going to hear all sorts over the next while and you'll probably have fecking WhatsApps going around saying X, Y and Z was doing X, Y and Z. But um, 
It's going to be interesting to see if if Liam Cattle is still in place for 2023. And I just say, even like Liam Cattle has done a fantastic job with Waterford. This is just, it's just spiralled off now for some reason. I don't know why. They've generally been unbelievably consistent under his watch. They got to an All-Ireland final from nowhere. An All-Ireland semi-final having beaten Tipperary and, and Galway along the way. Won the league. Does the league count for much now? Probably not. It's still a national title when the, the lads' careers are finished. But like on the whole, he has done he's done a pretty remarkable job coming from a really low ebb. Yeah, it, it does feel like the milk has turned a little bit there at the moment. We're going to have Colin Galvin on talking about Claire in a few minutes. He has to drop someone off to work, so he, he'll be uh, with us uh, soon enough. Let's talk about Wexford and Kilkenny. So Wexford 122, Kilkenny 118. And the remarkable thing here is that Kilkenny are still into um, the Leinster final against Galway because of the way the head-to-heads worked out and that it went to score in difference. And they're in that position, and obviously they've done better than the other teams to get to that stage. But... Kilkenny have beaten Dublin, Leash and Westmead and are in a Leinster final. And you contrast that with Munster, it's obviously a very different proposition. But where are Wexford going? Where are Kilkenny going? What did you make of this game? I'm going to ask you a question. Was this the worst performance by Kilkenny under Brian Cody? Like, and he's um, been, this is obviously his 20, was it 24th season. I could not get over how bad this was. I could well, not get 2019 over. 2019 All-Ireland was fairly horrific. That was pretty. That was pretty horrific. All right, yeah. Um, albeit they'll say that they'll say that we're down a man, but I just couldn't get over how. Yeah, but look, you, you're down a man. You don't have to lose by fourteen points. Tip were down a man in the All Ireland semi final against Wexford that year and won the game from five points down. So I mean, going down a man isn't an excuse to lose by fourteen points. No, I'm I'm more putting this like Wexford were at a fairly low ebb from from the week before. Are are Wexford going to win the All Ireland? Like I don't think they are. I don't think they're going to be in the shake up if, if I'm honest with you. Whereas Tipperary were in the All Ireland final. Um they were after, you know, they're after beating Wexford in the semi final, they're after coming with a bit of a run. Had loads of, you know, generational players, shall we say, and peaked at the right time. Whereas Saturday night, like Kilkenny were so disjointed. Like they went they went to guts about 20, 25 minutes waiting for a score from play. Um after after Massey Keown got that goal. I couldn't believe, you know, the style of play and how prehistoric it was. Like they were just puck outs were just going down in the 21. Um, and that was grand the week before against Dublin. But like Dermot O'Keefe was just set up. He was standing there. Like oh. it was, like it was just like they were putting ball down on top of Wally. Um, and while he's six for four, he's Mark and Potty Foley who's six for five. You know that's probably going to be a 50-50 battle. If you have Dio Keith standing to one side and Potty Foley trying to break the ball through, like you're, you're not going to win ball there. The, like uh, Paddy Deegan's deliveries, like over the shoulder, blind deliveries, just couldn't believe it. Um, Richie Reed, nearly every time he got the ball, it went to, went a hundred, hundred and twenty yards. There was no pattern to what they were doing at all. And having been brilliant against Dublin, like this, as as Jay did Laney said on, on commentary with Sky, this was like one step forward, two steps back. I, I couldn't get over how bad they were the other night. It was as bad a performance as I've seen for Kilkenny in a long, long time. Like usually, even like the water, I'm thinking of the Waterford qualifier game in 2017, where they were dead and buried and came back and forced to draw and Waterford pulled away in extra time. At least there was some sort of saving grace to that performance. It, I, I couldn't get over how bad this was. Yeah, I mean, funnily enough, you know, I mentioned the 2019 All-Ireland. Kilkenny were playing the same hurling on Saturday as they were back then. And Tip were playing the same hurling uh, back back then as they did at the weekend. It's as if there's two teams stuck in a time warp here. Martin Furlong says, nine wins, one draw on the last 15 meetings in favour of Wexford. The greatest run we've ever had uh, over the old enemy. And Just you know, on that, it's funny. They were saying on commentary, it's like, what is it about Kilkenny that raises Wexford's game? And I'm thinking, any Wexford fan... Uh, before probably like 2017 is thinking, what is it about the Razor game? Like they've been spanking us for the previous hundred and God, what, God, whatever knows many years. It's only in recent years. And in fairness to them, that was probably one thing under David Fitzgerald. I think Kilkenny were the standard that they wanted to get up to. They wanted to be regularly beating them. And this Wexford team obviously don't have any hangups about Kilkenny at all. And they have a really, really nice record. And from a, from an extra point of view, they've turned things around brilliantly. But like Kilkenny are falling into a Leinster final. Like they're literally falling into a Leinster final. 
Yeah, yeah. It's actually, Martin Furlong, again, since Wexford adopted the sweeper, Kilkenny and Cody have constantly struggled to deal with it. And so you mentioned already Paddy Deegan and, and Richie Reid putting snow on the ball an awful lot during the game and not really being too careful in terms of where it was going. So what I was thinking is, Porrick Walsh is sitting on the bench here. Obviously, yeah. he's driving in the forward line and he was flying it in the league in the forward and you know maybe averaging four or five points uh, from play per game. And you're thinking, this is arguably your best hurler in defence anyway. Arguably your best hurler. And you have him sitting in looking at it and you don't bring him into the game until the 68th minute. And you're telling me that he's... Like if, if a ball has been driven up the field by uh, Wexford, and we know that Richie Reid and Paddy Deegan and other defenders got on the ball a nice bit. So you can imagine that Park Walsh would have got on the ball a nice bit. What damage can he do? Like he can solo and carry the ball and he's got the vision that maybe some other players don't have. Like he would have done damage to Wexford in this game comparatively anyway. To yeah. me, I absolutely could not understand Park Walsh sitting up on the bench looking down at this. It was crazy. I put up like just a kind of a poll, a half time, kind of half messing, just like how many switches would Cody make a half time? And I just put a 15 minute time limit on it. And it was like one, two, three, none. And I was like, he's making two switches a half time here, has to at least. And Parik Walsh is coming in uh, because he's generally so ruthless. And he didn't, I couldn't believe it. No switches. Parik Walsh comes on with like five or six minutes to go when the game is, is dead, basically. There's a ruthlessness to Cody that at times you have to admire and then there's other times where you're just thinking like it's actually a bit mad like how is he totally lost like I don't know if he's totally lost fit with Park Walsh which would be, would be a mad thing to even consider like but like the fact that he's bringing him on so late what's Park Walsh two-time all-star I'd say I'd say one of their best players on the ball and just something on Richie Reid and Paddy Deegan I don't want to make it seem like I'm attacking them because I'm not but there were no options at midfield or half hour line a lot of the time. And that's why they were going long. Um, the half hours didn't look to be looking at the ball. And I see Richard Hogan asked the question there, is there a big difference between the style of the Kilkenny seniors and their under 20s? They were absolutely poles apart. Kilkenny under 20s were trying to play through the lines the whole time. They were trying to break the tackle and flick on a ball 15 or 20 yards. The ball going into the forward was always advantageous. You just couldn't say you couldn't say that the other night. I was absolutely flabbergasted by what Kilkenny were doing. It was dinosaur stuff. I couldn't believe it. Mm. Joe Butler says, I don't remember when Kilkenny scored only 1-8 from play in a championship match. Our worst performance in years. Flash says, Cody Stone Age tactics uh, can't handle modern day tactics. Uh, Dermot Williams, one week is a long time in a round robin. Clare got hammered by Tip and Limerick in 19. Something similar has happened to Watford this past week. Winning Leinster this year will be a good year for uh, Galway and Shefflin. Kilkenny were worse in 2017. Leinster semi against Wexford. Scored 3-11. Ah, uh, I, didn't, I don't think so. That game went down the stretch and Wexford threw an awful lot at them. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I remember watching that game. It was also on Sky. Can I just say something to you as well? I, well, know, this, I know this sounds a bit mad. I still think Kilkenny will probably win the Leinster final. Um, do you? I, yeah, People, just, what do you think? Yeah, no, I just think it's it's mad the way it'll work. There'll be a, there'll, I just think there'll be a reaction and there'll be a re reaction from Cody in particular because he was obviously, I think he was the one who was most disgusted with that game and the result and losing to Shefflin and Galway in Salt Hill. I, I wouldn't be one bit surprised if they won the Leinster final because they'll probably be written off in some quarters now after their, after their display the other night. Yeah, Bert Giggles Ash Tiger, who seems to be having a swing at everybody, says Kilkenny looked like a pack of sheepdogs chasing the ball. Absolutely no shape in every line. Backs hitting boom balls up the field. Literally no shape or plan. But like they're still in the mix for a, a three in a row of Leinster titles. Yeah. They haven't beaten all Ireland contenders. You know, I said they've beaten Leash, Westmead, and Dublin, but they're still in there and they could win a three in a row, which would be no mean feat to win a, a provincial three in a row. There's a great comment there from Sean O'Sullivan. Uh, can K K K K win the Leinster final? Does Brian Cody wear a cap? It's like you know, does the Pope wear a funny hat? They they definitely they definitely can, um, and they definitely can turn turn it around. But um, they don't have a settled team, Michael. Like no, day to day, like you couldn't pick the the Kilkenny midfield or forward line for the next game. Park Walsh might be thrown back into the backs, if, and I mean, of all the challengers left, probably Kilkenny are the more the the most unsettled looking team. And it's funny because um, Cody was interviewed before the game on Sky Sports and he just, like, I think Anthony Nash said to him, like, 
you know, you're worried about, you know, how many changes and whatever. And like, Cody's just the best man ever to flip things. Like, and it was just like, no, I'm very happy with my squad. Any lad can come in on a given day and play in any position. They're very versatile. You know, the, uh, Nash said about Keane, Kenny, like everyone was surprised to see him in the full forward line. Well, anybody that watches Kilkenny Club hurling would be no surprise he's played in there for his club and, you know, this kind of thing. But it's an interchangeable feast at the moment. And I just don't think that's, I just don't think that's a good thing. There doesn't like the the one thing a lot of people, Kenny people, will say, who is their midfield pairing? What's their best midfield pairing? We have no we've been saying we probably said that this time last year, and we still have no idea who will start midfield in the Leinster final. Adrian Mullen will probably start there, but who he starts with, we, we haven't got a clue. And even like Connor Brown was rushed back from injury to play the Westmead game and played maybe 40, 45 minutes and hasn't played since. Like it's just and he's not injured. It's just bizarre. It's like you get a chance, you don't take it, you're gone for a while until maybe there's a really bad performance and you have to switch what you started with the last day and then, then he'll maybe get in the next day again. It just, uh, there doesn't look to be much rhyme or reason to it, I have to say. 12 different scorers for Wexford. That, that's highly impressive and great for the squad and the panel and obviously the players that Dar Egan brought on as well. It's not too long ago that they were getting hockey by Wexford, sorry, by Watford in a league semi final. Yeah. Then they went out and lost to Dublin, somehow scraped the jaw, a draw against Galway. They look to be reeling, but you know, they're still in the fight. They're, they're back in the mix here. Uh, I'd like to give some props to Oshin Foley for his goal. The way he picked the ball up, soloed on and buried it low past Owen Murphy was, yes, fantastic. And the biggest compliment I could pay him is I thought it was Rory O'Connor when I initially yeah, saw him yeah, going through like that. Actually, yeah, same as actually, yeah, same yeah, yeah. And Rory O'Connor got two points, but he had an awful lot of whites. It was very uncharacteristic of him. But the fact that he's getting himself in that position all the time, you know, it just speaks to how good he is in terms of showing for the ball. And But the, I, I do think at times Wexford make it very hard for him in the way that they deliver the ball kind of straight down the line. So he'll run out from the 14, but it'll be a ball coming 100 miles an hour, not the crossfield ball that kind of drops in front of you and it's easy to collect and turn. It's coming at him 100 miles an hour straight up his throat, and then he has yeah, to turn, and the work starts from there, and often he's out on the sideline. I just wonder, could they work the crossfield ball to him a little bit more so he's turning on the edge of the D, a bit like Aaron Galan, the posts are wide open for you, and if he pins back the ears, the, go the goal opportunity is on as well. As Kieran Carey says, he has a serious pair of pins on him. So, you know, you just want to unlock that a little bit more because if Wexford are going to kick on to the next level, he, along with Lee Chin, needs to be able to run straight through on the goals now and again. Two things about that, Shane, 100%. If you get a ball straight down the line um, and you don't control it straight away, your man is in around you. If you get a diagonal ball and you don't control it straight away, you're actually bringing the ball away from him. So there's less chance of being able to get a flick in. You're bringing the ball away from him, but you're also bringing the ball into space and you're probably bringing the ball in the route of goal as well, yeah. So the ball is coming in. is like I think they're just trying to feed him anyway a lot, a lot of the time. But, you know, if they were able to get more of that diagonal ball in, he'd definitely do more damage. Like, his confidence was, like, there was a lot of uncharacteristic. He wasn't afraid to shoot now, in fairness, but there was a lot of uncharacteristic uncharacter wides from him. But they've won a game now. He's got that out of his system. Wexford shooting has been brutal in the last couple of games. Wasn't hectic at different stages the other night, but they've won a game now. You know, they're true now. The pressure is kind of off in a way. Uh, have a couple of things in that game. Mikey Dwyer's point when he came on was absolutely outrageous. Mm. And two things, or one thing I want to ask you, which was a better save? Damien Rex save slash roll lift or Owen Murphy save? In my opinion, Damien Rex was better. Without um, doubt. Yeah, because um, number one, he's not a goalie. Number two, he was just coolness personified to roll lift the ball in around the edge of the square with the toe of the hurl facing the wrong way as well. Whereas, oh, don't get me wrong, oh, Murphy's save was brilliant, but it was so much straight at him. Like anywhere else, and that's a goal, anywhere else, and he cannot stop it. The only thing I'd say uh, to sort of really emphasize how good that was from Owen Murphy is naturally, you know, being a right-hander, he's holding the hurley and it's facing that way. He turned it over to be facing that way. So mm -hmm. I think in terms of reactions, that was brilliant. But I don't think Connor McDonald should have ever given him an opportunity to make the save. He still did well to get the shot off because he had a man hanging, swinging out of him. But I still think that that should always be a goal. Oh, yeah. uh, the flip side, I mean, 
like obviously Mark Fadding messed up in the first place ball gets pulled across goal fair play to Matt O'Hanlon being in the right place at the right time but for Rick to do it again it was TJ wasn't it it was TJ yeah. who pulled on the ball ah like that was fantastic because he stretched the arm across and that would have been a devastating way for Wexford to get knocked out of the championship actually wouldn't it have been yeah like that, that's how close Dublin were to staying into the in the championship uh, so uh, <laughs> you, you might like yeah. the, you might like this now, Shane. But the championship is a better place for Wexford still being in it, as regards the colour and fanfare that their supporters bring. Like, I, with due respect to the Dubs, like they just it, there's not that same uh, enthusiasm around hurling. Like, do you know what I, do you know what I mean? They, they don't bring that same colour to it. Well, not um, in the same numbers. Not in the same numbers because yeah. there there is a hardcore of you know of diehards within that Dublin hurling support. But there's probably not the same number. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. just just on uh, on Rec as well. Like he's just been he's like that's probably that's probably you know the high point of what's been an unbelievable round robin campaign for him. He's been he's brilliant. He's probably been he's probably been their best player. Been honest with you, and I don't know how we've gotten this long into the conversation without mentioning Lee Chin, who was in on just he was in unstoppable kind of form. That's the you know when Lee Chin is in that type of mo mood number one, but when his body allows him to be everywhere that he was the other night, even like you know his points score. Could he find no smaller shorts though? Yeah, man, man. it's like they're de Ger Oakley used to wear size thirty twos when he was playing awfully. I don't know if it was to make himself look bigger and more imposing. We actually we played Wexford in the championship um, down there in 2000 and was it 2000? I can't remember what year it was, but it was the first year of the tight jerseys. And I remember Connor Matten saying to Oakley, like Oakley had the biggest pair of arms you'd ever see. And he's just like, Jay's Jer, they gave you a sleeveless jersey. Like it was literally up around his head. Like he was, <laughs> but um, he, he always did that. I don't know if it was psychologically to make himself look bigger, but Chin looked like an absolute tank the other night and he performed in fairness to him. He was everywhere. He was back hurrying in defense. He's had that hamstring injury. I think he had a dead leg even going into that game the other day, but he was back at like 2019 farm. He was outstanding the other night. And when he takes Everything else ticks around around Wexford, and uh, fairness to them, they were brilliant. They resurrected it from the week before. You, you do well find a player or two from their starting fifteen that didn't play well. They were they were outstanding all over. Full value for the win. And as your buddy uh, Andrew Sullivan says, they're Ger Oak Tree. Yeah, I remember in a magazine one time they had a picture of Oakley, and it was like you know there was a comparison, you know, a lookalike or whatever. It was Ger Oakley and Wolverine. Um, and it wasn't too far wrong, in fairness, with the hair kind of wagging in the wind. Uh, so Dublin, uh, th their championship season is over because Galway beat them by 27 points to 21. Uh, in terms of the scoring, Conor Cooney scored 13 points, 12 of those frees. Conor Whelan hit five. Cahill Mannion had a hat-trick of points. Joseph Cooney continues his scoring run with two. Fintan Burke, of course, got his obligatory sideline, but also got one from play. Kieran Fahey scored a point and so did Brian Kincannon. Donald Burke scored 14 points, nine of those from free, so five from play is a good return. Ree McBride with two, and then a point each for Chris Crummy, Paul uh, Paul Crummy, Danny Sutcliffe, Connor Burke, and Eamon Dillon. So that's Tipperary gone. Uh, actually, Sean O'Sullivan says, if anyone looks like Wolverine, it's a certain Mr. Shane Stilton. Yeah. But it's a bit bushier at times, I suppose <laughs> it does. Um, so, but like, that's Galway true. Obviously, Sean Brennan made a great penalty save at one stage as well. But Galway, they're in the hunt. They're still in the conversation. And uh, people are starting to wonder, are they all Ireland contenders now? Well, yeah, big time. Like, after the after the Wexford game where they threw a lead and Conor Whelan looked like he was going to be out for a couple of weeks, there was a few question marks. I know I definitely had a few question marks after after that week or that draw. But they've turned things around beautifully now. Um, they have a serious level of form, serious level of consistency. You know generally what... 13 of the 15 is going to be you have a fair idea what positions they're going to they're going to be in but they will you know they'll get tough in the Leinster final I I, too, I think you'll see a different Kilkenny in the Leinster final just by, uh, out of sheer defiance if if nothing else but you have to say Galway have done absolutely nothing wrong so far and from a Dublin point of view you know scoring one goal in a round robin series where they're playing you know, they're coming up against Leash and Westmead in the middle of that. As Jimmy Sline, Sline would say, the great uh, Mayo legend, simply not good enough. Like, that's just not mm. good enough. It's not. It's just not. That's that's not up to what's required. There's no point in saying any different. It's not. Yeah, yeah, definitely not. Um, I suppose 
very poor first half in this game. Apparently, you know, the referee was pretty fussy. Second half, Dublin very poor. Donald Burke, the only really man showing. Connor Whelan eventually, you know, did a fair bit of damage and put on Owen O'Donnell under a lot of pressure. And yeah, Shefflin quietly has that team humming. Yeah, one goal in five games isn't enough. Um, I definitely don't. I, I see, like, knowing Matty Kenny well, I would imagine he wants to try and turn this around next year. But I get a sense that not everyone else believes that, you know, that beyond the camp, everyone almost assumes that this is the end. It's four, year, four years in, Shane. You look at a couple of the big results. Obviously, beating Galway in 2019 was a big result. Was followed with that with that leash defeat, which just like took all the air out of the balloon really for them. Last year, they beat they beat Galway in the the Leinster semi final again. A Galway team, you know, subsequently revealed that they were struggling an awful lot. I'm just not sure. You know, after four years, they try and can you turn it around after four after four years? I'm not so sure. The lack of a goal threat is just absolutely killing them as well. Like it's the same kind of coming back to the same the same kind of problems. And I don't know if they're whether it's management or otherwise, whether they're overthinking it a bit too much as well. Because you, you talked about, you know, Dublin are not even you talked about the manufactured herders, but they were big, strong, you know, players or whatever. And they're kind of not do they're not doing what they used to do and they're trying to mix it with a modern game but they're not kind of hitting either if you know what I mean um so I, I'd be surprised if the, if there's not a change there um one of many potential changes I'd say in the off season it looks like yeah so um Colm Galvin is trying to log in there we're having a little bit of issues but in the meantime we'll try and sort that out we'll play uh the late one of our latest episodes of copycats, which I did with uh, Enda Varley and Nisha Waldron. So I'll bring that up and we can have a little look at that. <clears throat> in this episode of Copycats, we're replicating Martin Daly's famous back heel point against Tipperary in the Munster Football Championship for Clare in 2000. He got the ball, back flick over the bar from seven yards out. Absolute magic, five attempts each. <laughs> oh, the pressure's on. <laughs> He's oh, left footed oh, and he's going with his right. Finish here, <laughs> yes, oh, well, yeah. well, 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 well. What are we doing? I've got two balls. <laughs> oh, good save. Last one, you might need this end. Good softballs here. Ah. Ah. Right, Nisha, you're up. You're too far out. <laughs> oh, it's over! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it didn't look great, but it got over. Come back in, Letcher. Ah, jeez. Ah, jeez. I helped him out. Ah, jeez. Up. You see, he somehow got it in style going there. He knows what he's doing. How did you get 405? Pressure's on in a big way. Bring it into me. Oh, <laughs> one for one. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> 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 Making genuine attempts to save it too. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> See, one more. I feel like I'm being done here, but... <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. Ah, there we go. Then they come on in and we take our bait. And... I'm like Jimmy Barry Murphy, I can do it on. <laughs> Four out of five by 80% is not bad. Two for me. I think two for me. And uh, what you get? One. Yeah. <laughs> on top. Yeah, not exactly great from uh, Enda Varley, who's played in an All-Ireland football final. I'm delighted to say we're joined now by Colm Galvin. We got through the technical issues and we have you on the show. Colm, delighted to have you on. Uh, how are things with you? And I suppose, Claire back on top after the weekend. Yeah, um, absolutely great display. Um, from 1 to 15, even the subs that come on. Um, just an overall great performance. Yeah, yeah. Did you did you get into the match? I, I presume you obviously you, you you did get a chance to watch it with your brother playing and all. Yeah, 
Uh, sure, sure. Uh, look, he was uh, he did all right. Um, I thought him everything you know, so he's not too. <laughs> um, no, look, he he he, um, he did he did well. He do work very hard. Same as all the forwards, they they worked their socks off, and I think that's what really um, set them apart in the, the first half. Anyway. Yeah. So, what have you? I mean, obviously, this has been very frustrating for you. I, I'm sure that the fact that you've had to pull away and injuries have kind of taken their toll and that sort of stuff. And I suppose I'll ask you about that in a little while, but. When you've watched on Clare develop in the last couple of years since Brian Lowen has take, uh, taken over, what is it that he was trying to do that we're now seeing the fruits of? Um, I suppose just letting lads enjoy the game a small bit more, um, not putting restrictions on what way to play. Um, as you can see, that, that it's, it's just fluent hurling. There's no, there's no real game plan to it. It's just get the ball to the good delivery zone and give the forwards the best chance they have to work and to use the ball as best they can and get get good scores but from yesterday they were shooting from so far back <laughs> you would wonder where the game kind of came to just everything seemed to be going over the bar so just couldn't miss yesterday yeah. how yeah, refreshing Michael. is that column um from your point of view even as a player like just to be able to to be allowed play as you see it oh it's huge it's it's great for the players mindset uh going into the game that you don't have to be really worried about the game plan look there just probably is one or two little things that they're trying to work on in the game but as you saw yesterday more so that it's it's a it's a brilliant flow of hurling and they're just they're playing as they see it which is really refreshing and it'd, it'd be it'd be great for any setup to have mm. michael yeah, just just on that column, what's it like? Um, what's it like going in watching your brother play when you're not involved yourself? Um, do you like are you giving him pep talks in the morning, or what's that? What's that like? And you're probably as harsh as critic, I'd imagine as well. Yeah, I am. I'm his biggest supporter and hardest, hardest critic. So yeah, look, it's a bit, it's a bit weird, all right, watching it because you know you play with him for so long, and I play with most of the lads for ten years, eleven years, whatever it was. And you know, to see it out there, it, it was hard enough the first day. Was, I'm starting to come to terms with it now. It's a bit more. Mm, yeah, just just the the form of the likes of Shane O'Donnell and Peter Duggan since they've come back in. Did you think that they'd hit the ground running quite the way they have? Yeah, I did. To be honest, with you, because you're, the, those two lads are just unbelievably skillful, um, talented hurlers. Like uh, Shane O'Donnell had, Jesus, that game he had just it was just insane. Um, there's no one could get near him. He was bumping into lads twice his size and still putting the ball over the bar. Um, as for Peter, he was holding one lad off in the, in the second half of one arm and raising the ball and putting the bar over the bar as ease. So, look, those, they're, they're talking about two phenomenal hurlers. And I suppose if they even took it five years off, I'd say if they came back in, I wouldn't have any worries about them anyway. Yeah. And um, what, do you, what, what do you think is the reason for Shane O'Donnell's such improved form? Like, obviously, he had the concussion issues, but. Even long before that, we never saw, well, I suppose for a sustained period of time, we always saw sparks of it, but now we're seeing like a real consistency. What is it that's different now? Um, I just think that he's he's been allowed to move out the field a small bit more and get on the ball and, you know, he's interplay with the other players. He's able to read the game so well. Um, he's just been allowed to have a free role, basically. Um, you know, you, it's very hard to tie down a fellow like that, which he was for years, because he was always in the corner and ball going into me to work so hard to get and you know sometimes we're, we're, lads are hitting the ball from back in their own 45 and it's just up in the air and it's a 50 50 but now he seems to be getting a lot more joy coming out the field getting onto breaks and making his own scores which you know for him it's probably a new lease of life to be honest yeah? and you can see it in his play yeah and could you believe the the level of performance from Waterford in that game uh, yeah, I was, I was, I knew like this. It was a bit of a dead rubber for them, but whatever. But uh, leave it for us. But we, the performance, they just couldn't, they couldn't uh, handle it yesterday. Whatever, maybe I don't know, but they just not into it or whatever it was. It just didn't seem like they were themselves. Sure. Um, and yeah. you know, even with Jamie Barron, the corner, like he's, he's one of their, their leaders. You know, you want him around the middle and doing what he does best. But they just didn't seem to bring it yesterday. Yeah, and how much of a buy-in is there from the, the Clare supporters at the moment? And it's almost odd that Brian Lohan nearly had to fight to stay on as manager for this year. Yeah, um, and you think think about it now, if you, if you went back and asked those people what to think now, it would be a whole different story. So, um, But look, it's the, 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 when you have a team, when everyone's buying into the same system, it, it just works a treat, you know, and you've everyone reading off the same, same hymn and stuff like that. So look... Um, 
whatever he's doing inside in the, the trainers at the moment just seems to be working so I won't go too much into that yeah Michael just on that uh, column uh, yeah. Brian's probably quite enough figure in his media dealings and that I presume he's a completely different figure uh, behind behind closed doors he absolutely oozes passion from what I from what I can see during games and that how inspiring I suppose is he behind closed doors uh, usually, I suppose, look, he doesn't, he's a man of very few words, but you, when you get the look, you get the look and, uh, you know, just pull up their socks. But um, uh, look, just even going back from his own playing days, he's just, he's a man of few words and very quick actions and his passion is huge, as we all know. Um, and I think the lads see that in him. They don't need, he doesn't even have to say it really or what he does. It's just the way he, he is. Um, but what he says is lads just totally buy into that and listen to it, which is huge for, for a team, you know. I know you mm. said there's no restrictions put on, on players maybe with the style of play, but it's probably underappreciated, I'd say, how well coached Claire are in that. And even some of the tactical moves, even putting Tony Kelly in corner forward in specific games, um, even putting Shane O'Donnell out wing forward. It's probably underappreciated, I'd say, how well coached and I suppose how well thought out things are with Claire at the moment. It's not, it is a bit off the cuff, but there's an awful lot of thought put into what they're doing. Absolutely. Look, you, you, you coming into where he where he came from into the first year, like you know, you're not going to you can't work magic straight away. Like so, it's going to take a couple of years, and you know, it's going to take a lot of training sessions to see where lads' best positions are. And like moving Shane out has really, I in my opinion, uh, sparked a new lease of life into Clare. And um, with Dave Fitzgerald yesterday in the middle of the field, like these runs he's making toward up the goal is just unbelievable. You know, Dave McInerney seems to be on fire at the moment as well. So look, um, you've Rory Hayes, probably the top defender in the country at the moment. Well, in my opinion, anyway, he's himself and Sean Finn. Um, so look, well, it's, it's, it's taken a bit of time, but it's, it seems the fruits seem to be coming out at this moment, you know? Yeah, Colin, Colin a couple of things. First, do you, did you ever think Claire would be putting up 331 without Tony Kelly and the team? And just even to follow up on David Fitzgerald, 2-3 from play. There are times I see like, his level of hurling, his athleticism, ability to carry the ball, and I think there's like shades of Austin Gleeson to, to some of the things that he does. Yeah, she's a, he's a he's a powerhouse, you know. Um, he's the man six foot four, and he's probably a hundred kgs. You know, if he's running at you at full speed, you could all really want to get in his way. So, um, look, he's he's yeah, Austin's playing great stuff as well. But he he um. He way and he's on that when he's on that form, he's definitely confidence. He's an unbelievable player. So look, he's to have that in the middle of the field is it's, it's a great great asset to us anyway. Mm -hmm. And and where do you see this going? I mean, I'm sure you watched the game against Limerick as well. That was a draw. Maybe Limerick were down a player or two. They didn't have that much at stake in the game. That'll be the monster final in a few weeks' time. Where do you think Clare are in terms of like closing the gap with Limerick? Ah, it's very hard to know to be honest, you because. Uh, like coming to QZ Park is different than going to Turles for Limerick. You know, it's, it's it's a lot harder venue. Um, I think that Limerick will be absolutely in uh, unbelievable um, shape come Munster final. Um, God only knows where they train hard that week. You just don't know what's gone into it. Um, as you said, there was a couple of boys not playing. They're going to make a massive difference. You know, Aaron Glenn and so he's really going to test test the lads and. I, I would imagine Rory's probably going to pick, pick him up, so uh, that'll be a great duel to look forward to. Did you always realise that Rory Hayes was going to become the player that he's very quickly establishing himself as? Uh, yeah, he always has that uh, mentality of tack, uh, out in front, playing, playing, playing ball from the front when he comes in. But this la last two years, he's just blossomed. He just, I suppose, he's just got used to the role. He's not. He's not that long in the panel. I think he's maybe there four years now, uh, five. So look, but as you as you can see, his performance yesterday, even and the day before, was just uh, unbelievable. Scoring points from cornerback isn't seen <laughs> too often. So he's um he's he's a serious player, you know. Yeah, Michael. You just talked to me about the the mood change around Clare column. You know, this time last year the miners were you know getting you know hockey by Cork and. Maybe there was wasn't a great the mu music I'd say around Clare wasn't great. Uh, Brian Lowen has definitely helped to turn things around an awful lot. But the whole county in general, 
there's a lot, there's so much more optimism around. Obviously, if the senior team is going well, that feeds into it a lot. But but at every level, the optimism going around Clare is huge now. I'd imagine. Yeah, it is, Mike. Um, look, as you said there, um, when the senior team is going well, it does help a lot for other teams looking up to say, look, Jesus is great, and probably enjoying their hurling a small bit more, um, which feeds into everybody. And the one mood change is going to it's going to, it's going to help everyone's mood change. Then after that, you know. Um, you know, you have the minors, you have the 20s, they're all they're going well. So, look, I know the loss of penalties and stuff like that, but look, the, the whole moods, they got, get to go to Coosie Park yesterday and see a performance like that. You know, the whole optimism in the county changes, and um, everyone buys into it. I, I imagine everyone this morning is probably going around with a smile on their face and clear, thinking, you know, great, this is this is this is you. So, I think, um, that's the main, the main factor, really. Colm, can I ask you about the, the last couple of years of, of your own Clare Intercounty career? Like, you're, you're only gone 29, if I'm not mistaken, but injuries really took their toll, and obviously you had to make a decision on it uh, not so long ago. How tough were those last couple of years being involved with the panel? Um, look, I still love going to training and meeting the lads and having a bit of crack and stuff like that. Um, and it's great to have that routine of, you know, going to the gym in the morning and going to work or whatever, and vice versa going to train in, in the evening and then going to work next morning but yeah it was hard because you're you're um you're you're training you're training so hard and you're you want your body to be right you want to be fit and then next thing your hamstring goes and i oh, had yeah, osseous pubis my groin so the base is two bones are rubbing and i was in talks with the surgeon he said it actually mightn't solve anything if he went to do surgery so i decided to leave that off and um, see if I can do the rehab and so into Santry three or four times. Got a couple of programs, but it's it is so frustrating because you you're trying your best to get back and you want to do the training and, and be as fit as you can and be as good as you can, but then you're breaking down and you're missing a week or two here and you're just falling behind. So um at that level, as I said in a couple of interviews already, you if you're if you're not hundred percent you're wasting your time. If you're only operating at eighty percent to that level it just it's just a no-go so it's called a decision and i didn't feel it because my hamstring went twice in uh, about three weeks and i said it just had enough yeah well when exactly was it that you made the decision uh it was just end of january there right so you were in the middle of pre-season training you were hoping yeah. to, to build up and had you gone through a few weeks where you were starting to find a bit of physical form and you, you were thinking right season is ahead of me i'm, I'm ready to go not really, because I came off the back of a club championship where I was wasn't able to really train because I was getting so too sore. So I was coming into clear training, not really as fit as I wanted to be. And then you're you're trying to make up for last ground, and they get injured, and then trying to make up for last ground. So it's just mentally it was draining, but physically I wanted to do it, you know. But it just wasn't it was, it just wasn't working. Yeah, uh, yeah. Colum, I um, I went back training about three weeks ago, and I popped my calf yesterday morning, and I have this thing going nearly when I go training now. It's like an anxiety of picking up an injury because it's just happened that often in the last couple of years. Were you like that? Is there, is there almost like a fear going training of what would happen if you push yourself to a level that something will go or something like that? Because I've been that soldier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've gone to trainings, and I can just feel feel my body getting sore down well especially my grind but my hamstring as well I can just feel any any bit of tightness I would start to go oh shit is going to go again but um so I you always have that little bit of a fear all right uh, especially when you get a bit older when I was younger I didn't didn't give a care in the world I just <laughs> didn't even do a warm-up it's a um so look that now I find myself having to do a lot of stretching with bands and stuff even before I um, go training so Will yeah, you be I, able to, will you be able to stay playing with Clonlara Colum to some extent or what are you doing at the moment? Are you doing heavy rehab at the moment or I'm doing what I'm I'm trying to do is uh, use going to the water a good bit to be honest yeah. Um but I'm still playing with Clonlara definitely um now like Donald, that's our manager is very good. Like he'll he'll like if I feel any bit of tightness come up, you just say go over and do your own little bit of thing and then come back. So which is great. And so that'll give me a bit of longevity and hopefully a bit there for number of years anyway and did you um have you played a match this year since you decided to retire with claire have you have you played a few games yeah yeah i have i come i only played a half i was trying to get build it back up i was played a half and um, we saw i played against Crattler last weekend the full game and that went well so i am looking forward to now for the next couple of weeks and see how claire goes with, with the championship for ourselves and stuff like that 
Yeah, and when you talk about your your own clear career, what comes to mind? Is it the good days, the bad days? Or, you know, what what's the first thing that strikes you? Uh, it's mainly the good days, I suppose. But you'd always hear about the bad days too. You know, um, as a fella said, it's very easy from clapping the back and the kicking air. So um, you have to take the two of them together. Um, I suppose the main thing was the twenty ones when those those group of lads. You know, every time you see them, it's a bit of crack and. Um, we won five monsters in a row and three, three uh, All Ireland's, three minor and twenty one. So that group of, is always got to be a bit of crack every time we meet up. Even going into the match uh, against Limerick, like me and a couple of them. So that was it's uh, they're probably the, the main things I remember. Yeah. Uh, and what what day would you say like you hit your absolute height? What what game really went for you? Uh, I would say probably against Cork in the 21s in 2014, I think. Um, probably one of my favourite days to look back on. Um, other than that, probably against the Galway, the Galway 2018 above Park. Um, it was the first match of the thing when I went back as a sweeper. That probably sticks out as well, you know. Mm. And do you feel that season, the, the opportunity to win in All-Ireland just kind of slipped away from me a little bit? Did you think it was there? Yeah, uh, it, it probably was in the second half. The first half was a absolute uh, washout. Um, as for extra time, I did think we were going to get over the line, but I didn't know how well we'd fare out against Limerick if we did. Um, you know, Limerick were at the, the scene to be a walking animal at that stage. So, um, look, I, if we got over the goal, God only knows what would have happened, but it would have been a very hard game against Limerick anyway. Yeah, Michael. I know it's uh, it's nine years ago now, Colin, but what was it like, you know, as a young fella, what were you, 20 years old at the time, winning an All-Ireland? What was, you know, everything that comes with an All-Ireland, what's that like for a young fella in college at the time? Uh, I think you were in college in, in Galway at the time, weren't you? That must have been an unbelievable time, to say the least. I can't imagine at that age, you must feel like the world is your oyster. Yeah, um, I was in college in Galway and I actually moved down to Mary I then about a month later uh transferred over there to there <laughs> but uh it was crazy because um you know it you go from not anyone having to really don't know who you are to people like saying oh geez that's colour maybe or something like that even and they're saying well done and, and you, i was going down the hallway and people are talking i said cool <laughs> who are these people like and um you know it's just it was stuff like that but it was the mainly look trying to keep your head in the ground and being being humble about it but also getting back to work and trying to win another one, um, which was the ultimate goal, obviously. Um, so look, I enjoyed it. Everyone did. We were young. We didn't know really what we had done at the time, really, to be honest, you, because um, you know it's only now when you look back that you actually realise how big it was and how many people remember it and stuff like that. But at the time, we probably didn't. We didn't really care about it. <laughs> we did care about it. We didn't really show it. And um, we just wanted to go back out and feel it play again, you know. Can I just well, talk you... to you about about your just about your relationship with with Tony Kelly on the field, almost telepathic, I would say, nearly bet between the two. E just can you just talk to me about uh, about Tony as a player? Um, like I know people, I, everyone can say maybe how good he is or that, but like, what would be your memories of Tony as a player playing with him? Things that would separate set him apart, maybe from others. Um, it's his uh, hurling brain, I would say. Um to be honest, because he probably able to see see things before other people can. Um, you know, he's able to read where the ball is going to go, which is probably one of the biggest assets you can have in the game. Um, so he's going to have an extra yard or two on his on his defender or wherever he's playing. So um it's that and his his ability to do outrageous scores like Jesus, some of the scores he's got in the last couple of years, you you wouldn't get it in a video game. Um, so look, he's, he's just an overall brilliant player, and he he works his socks off. You know, he when he when he doesn't have the ball, he will work like he's not a prima donna where he just wants the ball into his hand and put over the bar. He will work for get the ball off his man or whoever it is. He'll work back to field. So that's that's probably what sets him apart. You know, do you think he can drive Claire all the way this year? Absolutely, yeah, I do. Yeah, and um, he's a great leader, and um, he's on the freeze, which is. Probably a big asset to him, you know, keeps him, even if he's having a bad day, he's still on the ball. People see that around him and that probably helps him, you know. And like you'd have Peter Dogan coming back and taking the freeze yesterday, but 
like Peter was on the freeze for years for us, but Tony seemed to step up the role and he seemed to enjoy it. And he's, he's the rest of his hurling's following the suit, so it seems to be a, a good relationship there. Yeah, and like, do you still see as Limerick as the number one team and Clare have a bit of ground to make up, or do you think like it is there now for Clare, Clare to just take that next step? I don't think they've much to make up. To be honest, Joe, I think that um, it'll be a very, very close game in the month of final. I see Galway has been um, a bit of a team to be watching out for Clare, and this will be building nicely. Um, Henry seems to have a nice, a nice setup done there, so. Um, it'll be interesting but between Limerick and Clare, I think that Clare have nothing to lose the next day. You know, I think it's that the pressure, a lot of pressure is going to be on um, Limerick. So it'll make, make for a um, great match, hopefully. Mm, okay, Michael? Any no, uh, I just think, um, was there anything, Colm, I would say, looking, looking at you when you were playing, you were probably the most comfortable player I've ever seen on the ball. Um, you just look so comfortable. Is there anything um, in your training or in your coaching that you can remember that helped you be that, say, comfortable on the ball and even the deliveries into the forward line? Um, always real sympathetic to the forward. Is there any piece of advice maybe that you'd give to young up-and-coming players um, just to, I suppose, not to be panicking on the ball or anything like that that they could take with them in their own careers? Um, yeah, I suppose, look, I always... I always tell children if if I'm ever given a bit of a coach or whatever that um you actually have longer the ball you think most of the time um you'll always you always people seem to panic that they're going to get hooked or they're going to get blocked but take that take that extra second to have a look up um especially when you're if you're a midfielder delivering the ball in and to one of my biggest things that I always try to do was never try and give a 50 50 ball try and give a ball outside of that that'll give them this maybe 70 30 chance to win the ball at least anyway. And that's probably my biggest thing that I can probably say, you know. Mm, okay. Well, Colin, look, absolutely brilliant to have you on the show. Really appreciate you taking the time and hopefully we'll be chatting again soon. Perfect. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Mike. We'll see you later. Cheers. Cheers, Colin. Come on. Great to have Colin on there to, to get all that insight. And uh, Imagine you say, Shane, that they're missing him as well. Do you know what I mean? Like, that he's not there. And they're still, like, imagine they had him available. Like, they're still doing what they're doing in spite of, you know, missing. I mean, you probably put it in their top three or four hurlers of the last God knows how long, really, wouldn't you? Yeah, and Patrick Coleman says, Shane, 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 Clare don't think Limerick are better than them. Well, I suppose the, the facts and the, the trophies would suggest otherwise the past few years. But yeah, mentally, you know, obviously you don't look at your rivals as thinking they're better than you. So, and over the years, they've had some decent results over them, 11-point uh, win in 2018. So yeah, you do understand from that point of view how you don't look at your rivals as being better than you. Uh, we've probably a few other results that we need to hit to before we finish up on the show. We were talking about Dublin uh, ending their championship season against Galway. Westmead, they're remaining in the Lee McCarthy Cup for next year. A 5-24 to 118 win over Leash. Uh, Niall Mitchell, I thought, was really good. He's been a good player in every game that I've seen this year. That even goes back to some of the league fixtures as well. So this is a this is a very good, um, I suppose, a very good season for Joe Fortune, all told, because he achieved relic, um, promotion to the top tier. He's gotten a draw against Westmead, his own, or sorry, Wexford, his own native county, and now he's secured their survival for next year. So, job done for him. Yeah, and outside of the Galway game, they were really competitive the whole way throughout Leinster. So, I think, yeah, I, I don't know, I'd prefer to see the more, more. I know it was a kind of a do or die game, but I prefer to see the more consistent team be rewarded, and Westmead were definitely rewarded. This was, I think it was a point in at a half time, and Westmead absolutely blitzed them in the second half. So they're, they're getting just rewards now. They're up, like they're getting Division 1 hurling next year on the back of a really good Leinster campaign and taking a point off a team that ended up qualifying from Leinster. So that can only that can only be a good thing for them. You'd imagine they're only going to get better. The steps that they have to, like there's a big gap, there's no point in saying any different. But early signs would su would suggest um, would suggest that they have potential to making it up. And outside of Derek McNicholas, age profile is pretty good, pretty good in Westmead. So they've loads uh, there's loads to build on. Yeah, and I suppose actually Leash ent enter a bit of a limbo period, knowing that Kerry winning the Joe McDonough final and that could save their top flight status. So I did say you know Leash had gone down, but obviously there there are those caveats just there at the moment. The scorers for Westmead in this game, Killian Doyle scored uh, seven points. Four of those were frees. Owen Keyes with 2-1, Niall O'Brien with 1-3. He's having a great season since coming back from injury. Niall Mitchell, as I mentioned, scored two goals. Joey Boyle with five. Davy Glennon with three points. Jack Galvin, two. 
Aaron Craig, Jack Gillen and Cormac Boyle scored a point each. And just a very disappointing way for, for Leash to finish their championship season after starting so well the first day out against Dublin. They could have got a win that day. Yeah, picked up a couple of knocks and Willie Dunphy, ah. Picky Marr and a few more. And they just, they, you can't afford to be missing those lads. And a lot, a lot of it is what they started on Saturday was actually, was grand. But what they were finishing with was they were having to go really, really deep into their squad and just didn't have the didn't have the players to call on. Um, difficult, difficult spot for them. At least they're in Division One next year. They'll be hoping for results elsewhere to save them. Um, but it's been, you know, all told outside of the Dublin game, it's been a really poor championship for this. You have to say. Yeah, the All Ireland Under Twenty hurling final. You were at this. Kilkenny nineteen points. Limerick eighteen points. So first. I suppose first all Ireland title title win for Kilkenny since two thousand and eight at this level. First title of any of any sort since two thousand and fifteen when they last won another Brian Cody. But Carl, like I don't I don't want to actually rain on Kilkenny's parade here because it was an absolutely brilliant win and I thought they were very good from pillar to post in this. But I have to say I was frustrated thinking Carl O'Neill had no match to play yesterday and he's probably sitting in the stands looking in and we're all wondering why on earth isn't this player in here playing this game? It's it's just madness to me. Yeah, no, it's a bizarre one. Like one of the best players in the country, you'd have to say, at, at that grade and unavailable to play a final. Oh, overruled that. I just, I don't get it. I, I totally agree with, you know, what a couple of managers have said that nowadays they would be managed a lot better. Players would be managed a lot better. They're not going to be, they're not going to be flogged. Um, and just, yeah, it's disappointing. If you look back through it, uh, you'd probably say this is not taken away from Kilkenny at all because they were brilliant. But uh, Cotton O'Neill, probably Limerick's best player, was missing in the All Ireland final. Oshin Pepper, one of Wexford's best player, was missing in the Leinster final. Gavin Lee and Tiernan Lee were missing in the Leinster semi final. Now that's that's Kieran not Joyce missing for Cork. Yeah, that's you know, outside. That's outside of Kilkenny's control, obviously. But uh, I thought Kilkenny were brilliant yesterday. Um, this their style of play is definitely not we'd say what the seniors are using now. Um, and Derek Ling and Mick Rice and, and Peter Barry, who've probably had some difficult enough times in recent years when they just couldn't get the better of Galway, they've they've stuck with it and produced a brilliant result yesterday. Billy Drennan was just outrageous. You know, he'd probably been relying on frees maybe up until this point. His free taking had probably got them to this point. He hit five from play yesterday and was just sniping any ball that went in around there. He was sniping and it was over the bar. Thought Ian Byrne was brilliant as well. He was actually unlucky to be denied. Uh, the two goal chances in the in the second half the 39th minute a brilliant reaction save uh, from Connor Handy Clark and then another brilliant reaction save uh, two minutes later freeze were lobbed in uh, Byrne pulled on them and Clark pulled off uh, Handy Clark pulled off two really good saves controversial moment Shane in the 20th minute Paddy Langton took a point and as he was hitting it he was kind of off the back foot and he just said oh I don't know if this is going to have the distance and it stayed going and going and going Handy Clark put up his hurl and brought it down. Uh, the umpire went for the flag straight away. I'm not. It I'm didn't not go sure. over. Yeah, I'm not sure how. I'm not sure how he went for the flag that quickly. Now I was chatting to um, a couple of the lads around Hawkeye uh, after the game yesterday, and I asked, "Was Hawkeye um, in operation in the first game?" And it was in operation. So I'd imagine if the ball, you know, if Hawkeye said the ball didn't go over the bar that the ref Thomas Walsh referee would have been told and the play would have been brought back. But that's that that's for another day. On the balance of play, that was obviously left you know, that was the point that was between them at the end. Kilkenny probably were the better team and deserved to win. But even at the end, Colin Coughlin had a chance and you probably would have, you know, nearly of all players, you would have put your house probably on him scoring. Yeah. Probably He's on definitely more comfortable like I've seen him score like five points from playing games. He's definitely more comfortable on the other side. He absolutely drills it on his left. But yeah. you know the, the Hawkeye thing, we've kind of looked into this before and hadn't got satisfactory answers in the sense of Hanley Clark put up his stick. So would Hawkeye detect the stick going over the bar and being far enough over or the ball? You wouldn't be entirely sure if you're going to get an accurate reading when the Hurley's involved in there as well and hitting the sensors. So that would be a frustration. By the way, do have to mention from the Kilkenny side, Harry Shine wasn't there. I think he's done a bad hamstring injury. Mm. And to win without him is quite impressive. So... We're not just trying to take away from Kilkenny. Like, this was a great win. And a lot of players who stood up thought Timmy Clifford is very good. Uh, Gro Dunn did some nice things. Like, there are players there that uh, that have played very, very well in the game. Yeah, Dennis Walsh is brilliant at wing forward. Peter McDonald is an absolute workhorse. The, the other wing as well. 
Parik Milan centre back really. You know, I thought their defence was very good to be fair as well. And Sean Personal full back too. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of fairly promising players coming through there. Um, that who knows who will be working with them uh, at the helm in, when they get through to senior level. But they definitely have plenty to work with from a Limerick point of view. Aidan O'Connor I thought was was brilliant. Probably in a couple of wides maybe in the second half, but generally he was the one that really took the fight. Uh, they really took the fight to Kilkenny. They were level 14 times. It looked for all the world that it was probably going to end up in a draw. But Kilkenny just found a little bit more uh, down the stretch. What you say about Hawkeye is, like, I tell you what wouldn't satisfy me is for the Brian Hogan incidents against Wexford is that Hawkeye shows that like the ball has landed down behind the goals or uh, projected of where it would land. Whether it actually went back over, it's just it's it's inconsistent and it's inconclusive in my view. And I, like I don't think the GA or referees or whoever need to be explaining every rule. Far from it. But with something like that, I think an explanation after. But listen, if 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 it wasn't a point, you're not going to be explaining it after, I suppose. Mm. But if they if they have the hard evidence to prove that it was a point and nip that in the bud, then I think they should use it. Yeah, go back to 2014, Barry Nash had a point that went over the bar for the Limerick Miners, and I think it was the system was calibrated for Gaelic football, right, so it ended yeah. up measure, measuring it incorrectly, and they didn't get it, so there was drama that day. Um, we'll blitz through some of the other results here, because I know you, you, you have to head away this morning. Uh, Kerry beat Antrim 29 points to 221 in the fifth round of the Joe McDonough. Antrim had nothing to play for, but Kerry's win, that puts them through to the final. Carlo beat Offaly, uh, Carlo 22 points, Offaly 17 so that's a big win there. I did think the red shorts looked like scarts on the Carlo players, but I'm not steering them. They did very well. Chris Nolan obviously played very well in that game. Down 228, Mead 219. So that's down saving their bacon in the McDonough and relegating. Just a, just a quick one on that, Shane. Did really disappoint them from an awfully point of view. Just yeah. was, That was a really poor a really poor game. Um, I only, I only got to listen to it, but I just chatted to a few people that were at it. Um, just a really, really poor game and a missed opportunity for Offaly. Fair play to Kerry. They must have been a bit soul destroyed after Offaly coming down to Tralee the week before and them losing by a point. So, um, you know, they've they're, they've been consistent. Like, they were in the final last year as well. Steve Malumphy has carried on the work that Fintan O'Connor there did there. And in fairness to Down, um, they've, you know, made strides all year and Mead have been by far you know, the worst team in the McDonough's. So with an average uh, scoring difference of minus 101 after five games, the right, you'd say the right team stayed up anyway there in that instance. Uh, Mead going back to the, the Nicky Racker or the Christy Ring now. Yeah, pretty comprehensive victories in all the lower tier finals. In the Christy Ring Cup final, Kildare put up 229 to Mayo's 19 points. So that one was never, never in question at all. The Nicky Racker Cup final, Tyrone 127. Ross Common, 19 points. Great victory there uh, for Michael McShane's uh, men. Laurie Maher Cup final, Loud 327, Longford 314, never in doubt there. The All Ireland Minor quarter final round one, Galway 25 points, Clare 9. And we'll just quickly talk about the football that happened over the weekend, the Talchon Cup preliminary round games. Wicklow beat Warford 316 to 110, never in doubt there. And in the other one, Wexford 213, Offaly 311. So your boys eked through after losing by I think it was was it just by a point that you lost to them in the in the Leinster first round? Oh, uh, I think it might have been a couple of points in the wind up, but that was a really tight game. It was fed down then a Scarty actually. Um, yeah, it's good to get a result. It would have been a disaster for us if we'd be beaten by Wexford in two championship games. Now we're back on track a bit um, and have the chance maybe to go on a bit of a run in the Halchin Cup. Just something that we probably missed, Shane, was the qualifier draw round one this morning. I'll just read it out to you. Excuse me. I, know, I, bless I, I, you. I, I knew it was coming and I was trying to I didn't know whether to stop talking or not. But <laughs> the qualifier draw round one. So it's Mayo and Monaghan, which is an intriguing enough game. Uh Claire and me, that'll be in Ennis, Cork and Loud, and Armand and Tyrone. So uh, yeah, I think that there's there are four really really interesting games. Armagh have the chance to you know Tyrone could end up out of the All Ireland Championship after playing two games. Um, Armagh they're looking for redemption. Armagh are also looking for redemption too after a really poor performance against Donegal. But there you have it. There like you you do you do well to confidently confidently call the four winners there now. Even for Loud Cork Cork's not a bad draw for Loud. No, it's not. Um... 
It's definitely not. Like, Loud have been playing quite well. Like, Claire Meath, they played a couple of years ago in Leash. I remember seeing that qualifier game. Mayo against Monaghan, that's tasty. Mayo really need to get back on the horse quite quickly. Monaghan definitely were second best in their uh, match against Derry recently. They are pretty tasty games across the board. So we'll, we'll definitely be ramping up our football coverage in the coming weeks. It was obviously a pretty quiet weekend in football. It was very much all about the hurling. By God, we got some we got we got some interesting storylines over the weekend. Just on that chain as well, like the Tolchin Cup started, and it was you know it was a real quiet start to it. It was bigged up in the media in that during the week, and there was loads of lads up for interview. But you definitely say it didn't exactly take off in the manner that you would hope it would I hope it did. So hopefully that's not that's not a not a sign of things to come. Wicklow had a really good win and, and Offaly had a good win back on back on track as well. But hopefully that'll ramp up over the coming weeks with a bit of luck. Who would be your goat of the week? Goat of the week, Conor Lahan in the hurling was just like six shots in the first half, six points. Um, he was that unmarkable that nobody even knew who was marking him. <laughs> I give it to Kevin Quinn in the football for yeah, uh, for Wicklow. Very good, yeah, very very good, and he he's looking like the next generation for Wicklow. He could be there for the good to ten or twelve years. Brilliant player. I think he's is uh, the great Kevin O'Brien is his uncle. I think as well. So he didn't lick it from the ground. No, he certainly did that. Okay, that's it for the show. A reminder, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code OURGAME and you get 15% off. Great selection of jerseys. Like the ones we're wearing here, we won't be seeing the blue and gold in the Hurling Championship this year. Maybe we'll be seeing it climbing the steps in the Talchon Cup. Keep the fingers crossed for that. That's it. That's it for the show. Thanks very much. We'll see you on Thursday at patreon.com forward slash OURGAME. Join us there. It's a great show always with Kieran Carey and Richie Power. Thanks very much, Michael. Cheers, Shane.